unless anybody has um, something that I don't know about. Okay, so without objection, we'll consider the agenda approved. Uh, so on to general business and appearances, and so this is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on some topic that is otherwise not on our agenda, and if you would uh, have anything to say, um, as with all other comments, generally speaking tonight, um, if you would say your name, where you live, and try to keep your comments, I'll just say brief for now. Um, so any comments from the public? Be brief, but I'm going to talk fast because I have a lot of ground to cover. <laughs> Steve Whitaker. Uh, I want to open a discussion that's going to obviously take several meetings and maybe even an agenda item to explore further. Uh, I've titled the document Seriously Misplaced Priorities. Uh, and I this is a compilation from dozens of Montpelierites that I've been out reaching out and meeting with. Uh, when we're spending 200000 for wayfinding signs, millions on a bike path and bridge, millions on a multimodal transit center with no rail platform, and so many dollars, I don't know, on the downtown master plan with an uncertain gras prospects, while we have obvious unmet needs, priorities on stopping the sewer gas from arising from the storm drains right around state and Maine, East State, and Maine. Uh, it's, it's a serious problem. That blanket kept one of them blocked for uh, the last three or four days. Uh, I took it off because the rain is coming. But if anybody needs a whiff, uh, it's there. It's absorbed plenty. It's wool. Uh, paving drainage at the crosswalks I've been bringing to your attention for years, and it has not been addressed. The paving effort made a few a month ago still does not drain. I've got photos of all this and we're heading into winter again. So we're going to have ice in the crosswalks, which is a, a real safety hazard and somebody's going to get hurt. Clean and safe streets. We've got trip hazards. The sidewalks are heaving. We just grind them off and bevel them. So there's still a two or three inch level differences. We've got a sinkhole out on St. Paul Street that's big enough for a kid's leg to fall in and break. Um, missing and haphazard curb stones, the curbs that were removed for the water Main Street break, uh, East, East State Street break have not been put back in. The street sweeping has been skipped for three weeks until yesterday morning, and even then it left a trail of dirt, uh, a, a mounded trail of dirt which continues to blow around. Who's supposed to clean up the broken glass, the, the feces, the vomit? Etc. This this stuff has been happening, and everybody says, "Not me, not me." Um, the vacuum cleaner for the sidewalks I've raised uh, as an option, as a good alternative. Uh, no no action, no response. We need to fundamentally and uh, as soon as possible stop the combined sewer overflow, dumping human waste into the river untreated. Uh, CV PSA, CV fiber. I have not heard back from my report on that problem. Uh, we're at risk of losing that multi-hundred thousand dollar investment. Uh, our police chief is in a position to help expedite the records request for those tele tower infrastructure of Capital West, and he is in effect saying, I don't have them while he's writing an RFP with Scott Bagg, who is one of his part-time dispatchers. We can't have officials, public officials on the public dime impeding public records requests and pointing at the other guy. Uh, last year's Christmas wreath I've mentioned before, still sitting right out here outside your window. Uh, SD Ireland spilling that road base down the riverbank into the river got a free pass apparently, even though I called it to your and the state's attention. The missed opportunities, the truck, I got one more minute, the, the truck access we're, to keep the tractor trailers from parking in Main Street, we're going to miss that opportunity to integrate trucks through the new parking lot into the North Branch lot. The city, our new public works director, uh, is now aware of it. The city needs to forfeit four spots in the North Branch lot in exchange for Abishan moving their propane tank and creating a, a path exiting by 
the old pocket park it, to the uh, we're missing an opportunity with the electric vehicle recharging stations in the new lot. What better way to bring tourists to Vermont, to Montpelier, to shop and eat while their ch cars are charging than to simply put chargers there available to them? Uh, we have been charging people on the 4th of July and on Bennington Battle Day for meters un unfairly. I'd ask the city council to refund everyone who paid by credit card. And it's a missed opportunity for the merchants to have paid for the bags that say free holiday parking and the bags are courtesy of the merchants, right? It's just a simple goodwill, good advertising, but charging people when they shouldn't be charged is not right. Uh, put the Saturday state and main stoplight into flashing mode. We're backing up all the way to the rotary and backing up to Memorial Drive with traffic, even because they're making a turn for State Street traffic which isn't there during the farmers market. So I talked to the pro part programmers working down at Bailey today. A city official with the key can simply put that light into flashing mode from 6, 6 a.m. or leave it in flashing mode from 6 a.m. till 2. That would, that would solve the problem. Um, postpone the downtown master plan until the garage appeals are resolved. You, I'm told that the con consultant has been directed to plan as if the garage is going in. That is a mistake. It's unfair to the people. It's unfair to the appellants. It's, it's a waste of money. Um, You're close, right? Sure. Okay. Yeah, the, uh, you could use a heat pump to capture the heat from that com computer room. It's a noise impediment in here and heat the water for the downstairs bathrooms with that. Uh, we need a comprehensive traffic study, including construction impacts, a rail study, satellite parking alternatives, pit alternatives, a visible log of all public records requests to the city, and a visible log of all correspondence in and out of the city so that people know that a request has already been logged and don't repeat it. Thanks. Thank you. I know it's a lot. No, I'll it's okay. The writing. And yeah. there's some great ideas in there. All right, any other uh, comments from the, the public? I'm Sue Allen, and for two more days, I'm the assistant city manager. And I just wanted to take a minute to say, to highlight two things I've learned in the last two and a half years that I've been here. And the first is that you have some of the best city staff working for you I've ever encountered in my years in government. They work nights and they work weekends. And we do hear, you know, week to week litanies of things that have gone wrong and I want you to know they put it all heart and soul out there for the residents and the businesses of this city and I applaud them. And I also want to just take a minute and applaud you all because I have watched you for two and a half years give up your nights and your weekends and answer all your constituents questions and really put yourself out there for the public and I want you to all pat yourself on the back for what a wonderful job you do. And I thank you for letting me work for you for the last two and a half years. I've loved every minute of it, and I wish you well. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Hello, my name is Seth Collins. I live in Berlin, Vermont. And at some point, I would like this council and the town of Montpelier to address the shooting deaths of Nate Giffen and Mark Johnson. Thank you. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Um, yes. In what format do you envision that? And um, well, uh, could, couldn't you put it on the the agenda for one of these meetings? Is that how it would go? That's a possibility. We could. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Thanks thank so much. You. Thank yeah. For sure. Okay. Any other comments? Okay, all right, uh, so thank you all, uh, moving on. Um, so uh, onto the consent agenda. Um, uh, we did and it's sort of a last minute catch a, a pretty um, brief typo in the, um, the minutes. I don't know if it's appropriate to um, pull it them. Be the one I already adjusted. Is it, is it um, that Jack McCullough voted nay on an item that he did not vote nay on? No. Okay, there's that. Let me go back and check. Okay. Okay. I want to go back. Okay, because I, um, Jack, you didn't vote nay on the um, the zoning fix regarding the Sabins pasture. No. Okay. I, I might have moved it. I'm not sure. 
Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No worries. Um, I think Ashley might have voted nay on that. She did. Yep. And so that was recorded, but it also said that you had voted. Okay. Nay. All right. All right. Anyway. So. Um, uh, so regarding the consent agenda, is there a motion uh, regarding that? So moved. Uh, with the, is it with the absence of item A? Oh, it is indeed, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> second. Uh, is there a second? Second. Okay, further discussion. Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, thanks. And, um, and we'll look at those uh, minutes at a later time. Okay, and so we uh, we have a couple of public hearings to do. So um, one of them is um, uh, regarding the Vermont Community Development Program, and so I want to um, invite um, uh, Eileen, and I think I don't know if Kevin is here for that too. Um, whoever. Um, so this is a public hearing, so I'm going to officially open the public hearing on that. Um, we'll hear from um, these folks, and then if there's comments from the public, we'll take them afterwards. Welcome. Would you like me to just oh, yeah. explain just, it a yeah, little bit? Just really briefly, like what are these for? And sure, such. sure. So this is a um, Vermont Community Development Pro Program using the Community Development Block Grant for what's called our Green Mountain Home Repair Program. This is a program that's been in existence for about 15 years. Um, because it's Community Development Block Grant, it requires a town um, or city to uh, support it, as I think you all know. Um, previously, we've had the town of Northfield, we've had the city of Barrie, um, and now we're asking Montpelier to step in. Um, at this point, this is a consortium agreement. A few years back, we actually merged our program with the Wyndham and Windsor Housing Trust, which serves um, Wyndham and Windsor counties. Um, and Brattleboro is actually the lead community, so lucky for Kevin, they do all the paperwork. Um, and all that we're really asking the city is to, to support um, the application and all you need to do as far as work is really do the public hearing. So, and I did hand out a little bit of brochure to all of you that explains what it is. So essentially it is um, a program available to low income residents in Washington, Orange, and Lamoille County um, to do home repairs. Um, I'll leave it at that. Wonderful. Um, this brochure actually answers the questions that I had, which were specifically like what kinds of repairs uh, would be eligible for uh, right. these kinds of grants and just so everybody's aware it's um, uh, resolving um, health and safety issues like mold asbestos and lead paint um, fixing structural problems like leaking roofs or foundation issues or wall issues um, older failing electrical plumbing septic um, modifying the interior exteriors for elderly or disabled occupants and then um, upgrades for energy efficiency, weatherization, air sealing, et cetera. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody was aware that, because I, I, I assume that if there's a, a homeowner in town, they should get in touch with the city um, if, if we receive these the, these funds, or um, who, how, how would somebody so, no, go so about they're, accessing So if they're this? interested in the program, uh, I did leave a brochure over there, but they can reach out to Downstreet and we okay. can work you through the process. So it is for low-income individuals, um, so 80% area median income or below. And typically it is funding of last resort, so if people are not able to get financing through a traditional bank, um, they're able to do it through us. And right now, and this happens occasionally right now we do actually have the ability to offer part of the money through grant and it is a loan program but many of the loans are actually zero percent deferred so you're not actually making payments on them and that's yeah. one thing that's sort of challenging about this program is people tend not to apply because they think they can't afford debt but if they yeah. can't actually afford the debt we still can work with them yeah okay wonderful um, how I'm sorry I have one more question um, how how do you get the word out about this kind of program? So uh, we do a fair amount of advertising um, in the paper. Um, we have on occasion, and we can certainly do this again, um, insert, had done it as an insert, you know, in a tax bill or something like okay. that. So we usually do that, you know, um, in the larger communities every other year. So sure. we can certainly do that in Montpelier. That, I, like, I think that would be wonderful. Just as an aside is that, you know, I kind of have a, in contact with Patty at Home Street pretty frequently, so I'm referring people, and there's a pipeline so that uh, okay. <laughs> if, if people have questions, they can come to me and I can okay. direct them to the right person. And they would uh, ultimately go to, to Down Street. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, yeah. wonderful. Any other questions? OK, 
Okay. Any comments from the public? Oh, uh, Lauren. Um, is this like a first come, first serve kind of thing? Or, I mean, I'm, I was excited to see the energy efficiency, knowing that we're doing this whole energy efficiency ordinance conversation and the ability to help um, lower income folks access money to do the kinds of things that we're hoping more people will do. Is it, does, is it just kind of whoever comes in the door and whatever kinds of projects are eligible or are there kind of buckets for different kinds of projects? Um, so there aren't buckets. All of them are eligible. It is first comes first serve, but we do actually have a, a fair amount of capital that's accumulated. The idea of this is that so the people who are repaying are refurbishing the capital, so it's a revolving loan fund. So we haven't reached a point where we've had to say no because there isn't capital. Great. More likely what happens with, these, with this money is you have to income qualify one. Um, and when we go into a home, we are required to meet what's called housing quality standards. So people may want to do energy efficiency work, That's but if the roof is failing, it has mm -hmm. to be addressed. And then sometimes the project gets too large and people feel uncomfortable with that amount of, of debt, you know, even if they're not paying on it. So sometimes that's a challenge. Gotcha. But, Thank but and, that's helpful. and this money is um, uh, on the whole divided up amongst different uh, counties. So is it, there's a certain amount for Washington County? No. Okay. No, so, so it's great that you're asking me these questions and we're advertising it. So okay, yeah. okay. great, <laughs> <In Montpelier>. excellent. <laughs> so, we should so yeah it's first come first applying. serve within the five within <laughs> okay. the five counties but like i said there is there is a fair amount of capital available yeah. okay well great and uh if you have a question go ahead uh peter kelman uh, college street uh i think the mayor's question about how do people find out about this is a very good question and the answers were not as good as the question um <laughs> The very people who need this money are people who need outreach to them, not to come by your office, Kevin, and get in the, quote, pipeline. There needs to be an affirmative effort to reach people of low income and to let them know that there's money to help them. Okay. Do you have any suggestions, Peter, as to what more could be done? Well, it does relate to my larger concern about communication in town. There are people who know things and people who don't. There are people who know where to look and people who don't. There needs to be some kind of rethinking of how government communicates to the poor people in town, the people who, who rent, the people who have homes that they own but can't afford to fix them up, people who are homeless. We just need to figure out do I, I, sure, I have some ideas, but I th and I think that setting up the, uh, the task force on homelessness is the kind of thing that I think is a good beginning. But there are people who have homes who also need some attention like that. So I, I don't have an answer, but I think that we, it's something that we need to tackle. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, Erica Rail of Vermont Center for Independent Living. We actually have an information line at our center where we've referred people to this program. Um, and we work primarily with people that are low income and disabled. And it's a great program. Um, people can call us. And we have referred and worked with Downstreet on many, many projects. Um, so there is actually a place where people can go and get information on this. And it's actually um, our number is statewide. so. And we also have a database on this. So the, the information is being disseminated. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Did you have a question, Glenn? Yeah, um, on that, can, can you uh, give us any sense of how often you get calls on that line? Is that ringing uh, off the hook once a <laughs> month? Off the cuff? Um, yeah. I'd have to say uh, weekly um, on just housing primarily. Uh, about 25, 30 calls um, for, uh, from homeowners. Um, we're constantly retrofitting. And when I say retrofit, we're dealing with old housing stock here in Vermont. So we're putting ramps on. We go into a house. We see there's mold. Uh, they need um, uh, new, gla uh, new glass. We see that there's 
uh, installation. So we're always working with Downstreet, USDA, uh, weatherization programs. I mean, we partner with anybody, anybody who will help um, people with 80% um, because we're working with the poorest of the poor out there. And we'll, again, we'll work with anybody. And Downstreet has always been um, a great program to work with. 25 or 30 a week? Mm -hmm. uh, a day. Oh, a day? Yeah. Wow. So people really are accessing that? People are accessing these programs. Yeah. Um, okay. And yeah, so it's a great, it's a great, I, it's a great program. Great, wonderful. Steve Whitaker, Montpelier. Um, I just want to second the comments made by the Peter uh, regarding the awareness. This is a no warrant public hearing, and we're seeing the hear warning of the public hearing for the first time now. Uh, I would contrast that to all the publicity that was done around the the Barry Street, uh, Barry and Main intersection, or the energy efficiency. We, we really made an extended effort to get make people aware of those things. It got in the press ahead of time. Um, but this, I'm concerned that without having time to process and discuss this among folks, we're barreling down a track here that might not be reversible. Uh, it, it says that one application is for 375,000 to be shared among <coughs> the five counties or so, so many counties. Uh, following item on the agenda is possibly a competing grant to the same program uh, to take care of some three buildings right here in Montpelier. So are we going to have two grants? Is one going to win out over the other? Can we get them both? Uh, but I believe we need a process whereby the priorities for how this money is spent are discussed and uh, established in a more uh, informed process than we've had so far on these grants. Uh, so Stephen, I, I can actually answer some of those okay, questions. Okay, I really you. don't want to see the uh, another way and the other buildings that are housed. Uh, so Stephen, we're applying for um, the another way and Washington County Mental Health Grant is for um, a VCDP IG grant, an implementation grant. This is a scattered site, so there's separate things. Like we could also apply for, um, uh, like a, an accessibility modification grant in the same round, but there's two separate funding pools. I guess so. It's I, not going to be competing. I'm not going to. It's a separate. Okay. It's a separate. That's, that's it's all the same funds, but separate pocket pools of funds. That's good to know. What my pointing, my point is being made is that there's not been enough discussion or education about these different pockets or pools or what say anybody has. What's the point in holding a public hearing if the decisions are already made and people aren't informed about what choices are to be made in the public hearing? Uh, Did, to be aware, unless though, there's a second for, public hearing coming. But after. to be clear, we're applying for federal funding. This isn't a loan. We're not borrowing money. We're, we're applying for federal funding through the Vermont Community Development Program. I think I've made my point, yeah. is that Thank you. Uh, Thank it, you. it might merit a second public hearing and some pre-education about what choices or impacts or priorities might the community want to establish for this. Um, okay. Thank you. Any further comments? I'm not sure if people are getting up to talk about this. Okay. No. Okay. Um, all right. So I'm going to close the public hearing. Um, and I think we need a motion um, regarding uh, regarding this resolution. Am I correct in that? I yeah. move that we uh, authorize the department to uh, submit the application for the VCDP scattered, scattered site grant. I'll second it. Outline. Further discussion? Um, I just want to also say um, I'm um, so grateful for the outreach that's been done in the past and for the opportunities that people do have for um, accessing this. And I am happy to talk through any other ways that we can um, just get the word out and uh, uh, see about advertising it. I mean, I wonder if we could be posting something on Front Porch Forum to say, like, hey, that this money 
exists. Um, that might be a great um, way to, to get the word out. Anyway, so I'm just thinking out loud, but um, there's been a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, this motion passes. Thank you so much. And um, on to um, a second public hearing. Um, this one is regarding <coughs> uh, Brant. Actually, I'll, I will let you. Sure. I'll let you explain it. Um, the city. The um, oh, is sorry. Before you do that, I'm sure. going to officially open the public hearing on this. Oh yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> you beat me to that one. Yeah. Um, and Amy Wright uh, is going to join me. She's the consultant who's working with Another Way and Washington County Mental Health. And I can have Amy give some, and Sunny, correct? Yeah. yeah. Um, we'll all come up. We'll all come up. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I was approached uh, earlier this summer, or actually spring, I guess it was, um, that Washington County Mental Health and uh, Another Way were looking to do some renovations in the buildings at 6290 and 125 Berry Street. Uh, 60 and 90 are owned by Washington County Mental Health and 125 is another way. Um, so there are a number of, of health and safety and um, um, actually, what's that? Energy. And energy efficiency uh, projects uh, that'll be tackled by these, uh, with these funds. Um, so we would be sponsor, we would be the sponsor for these funds. Uh, they're applying for $625,000 and um, we're hoping that they receive it because it's, these buildings are in dire need, and Barry Street, um, they're really cornerstones of Barry Street. Great, any questions? Um, uh, Donna. Uh, is there any local match? I didn't see it mentioned here. Did I miss it? No, not currently. Um, we do have access with um, the VCDP program. They can access our revolving loan funds if necessary. Um, generally speaking, we don't, most pro projects can't afford to take on additional debt. Um, and our revolving loan funds do require repayment um, in some cases. Um, but, uh, but no, we don't have a, a local match. So we don't oh. have one or we don't need one? Um, you, it, it's not required. It's always oh. helpful okay. when the city uh, contributes something. Um, but I, I think what we are saying is that the city has given another way um, tax exempt status, which is extremely valuable to the to the property, and that and Kevin's time and in, in administering the grant without you can charge for administering the grant and um, and we're not asking for funds for that. So you know we're grateful for that. And other matching funds come from um, another way has secured a number of smaller grants and saved its money from its fundraising. Washington County Mental Health has a. Um, has an organization-wide reserve that every penny is <laughs> needed um, is counted twice before it gets spent, but there's a portion of that that will be going into the grant. We may need one more source. We're just looking into that as our final costs come in. Further questions? Uh, Jack. This isn't a question, but it's a comment. Um, <clears throat> in, my, uh, in my day job representing people in, in voluntary mental health proceedings, I regularly have people who are residents at 62 Barry Street, and I'm always arguing with the state that, you know, the mayor and I have been on this uh, committee hearing from Central Vermont Hospital about the expansion of their psych unit, and I'm always saying what we need to do is to support uh, an adequate number of uh, community resources in order to keep people who don't need to be in hospitals out of the hospitals, and I think this is uh, the services provided in these uh, facilities are are very important. Thank you. Further comments or questions? Um, comments from the public or questions? Yes. Hi, Eileen Peltier, resident of Montpelier. Um, I just wanted to speak on behalf of this application. I think that. You know, as um, Councilman McCullough was saying, these types of programs are critically important. They're serving the most vulnerable people in our community. Um, I was just hearing that another way served over 600 individual people in the past year. That's a big number. Um, I've been in all of these buildings. They need help. 
Um, and managing these budgets and doing the incredible work that these two organizations do every day, it's really challenging to do and to find the money to make the capital improvements that are needed. And the community development is a uh, block grant is a great resource to do that. So I just want to say I support it and hope you do too. Okay. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rick DeAngelis. I live in Montpelier. I'm also the board chair of Another Way, so I have a bias here. But, you know, Another Way is an amazing organization. It's actually been providing a safe haven for the most vulnerable people in Montpelier for 35 years. And, um, and about 15 years ago, we bought the property on Barry Street. Uh, it, was a it was a wreck at that time. Uh, we managed to keep it going. Um, and last year, uh, with private financing, we did phase one. We did the most immediate uh, needs of the building. But uh, there's more that needs to be done. And the work that we're doing in this phase, I, it's all about providing people with the basics uh, to come in and get you know, a, a warm meal, to use the bathroom, to do your laundry. And um, I think it, it's very important to them, but it's also important to the city at large that we have that capacity within Montpelier. So um, I hope you'll support the, uh, uh, the proposal. Thank you. I'm Zach Hughes, um, Montpelier, also prospect neighbor. Um, so I, I support the uh, grant as well, so I'm familiar with these facilities. And to another way, I have to say, you provide that sanctuary, plus you provide another option for folks who don't want to engage in um, traditional services. Uh, that option is important. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say is I serve in capacities at Washington County Mental Health. And I also served uh, in one of those committees that Jack just mentioned at the hospital. And I took two trips out to two different hospitals, uh, one in Minneapolis and Pennsylvania as part of this expansion project. And I too would uh, argue for more community supports like peer crisis beds. We have one here in Montpelier called Maple House. So I just want to say I support these funds at this time. Thank you. Thank you. So I didn't leave any ambiguity with my prior comments. I, I still like the outreach uh, the, the, my outreach uh, plan, I do support this wholeheartedly. Uh. Thank you. Donna? Now, we need to sign a resolution, so we make a motion oh, to well, adopt it, or um, what do we yeah, do now? Yep, so is there a any further answer. public comment? Okay, so um, we're going to close the public hearing on that, and then is there a motion regarding this? I was going to make the motion to pass the resolution for the VCDP Grant Application Authority. Second. Second. Oh. <laughs> you got it. OK, further discussion? <coughs> all right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank you all. Thank you for your work. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. OK. Um, OK, so on to the um, appointments to the um, Homelessness Task Force. Um, and actually, as I am trying to access that on the internet, it's not working right now. That's exciting. Um, uh, it's possible. Um, in any case, there were a number of people whose um, names and, um, uh, uh, well, there's a number of people who um, expressed interest in serving on this uh, committee. And I know a number of them are here, and so I would. Um, we do have the list here. Uh, there are some additions I, to what was there, but um, in any case, if there's anyone here who um, is interested in this uh, task force and is, is here tonight, 
Um, if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself and explaining your interest in this, uh, participating in this task force. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's one thing. And then I, um, actually now that I'm saying it, I wonder um, if it makes sense for us to um, start with the, the mission so people sort of know more or less what they're signing up for. So actually, I think we should start with the, um, what is the, the goal of this? What is the, what are the outcomes um, that we are hoping for from this group? And let's, um, I think we should probably have some kind of emotion regarding the task. And then we'll go to um, uh, uh, applicants. Um, does that sound okay with everybody? Um, okay, so. Um, we do have some language about uh, what the task would involve to um, be on this committee. Um, any thoughts or comments on that language? Well, yes. One, in Jamie's email this afternoon, she mentioned there was going to be change from what was on the link. And I don't know if the printed one is the changed one or the same as on the Just link. imagine it's on the link. I'll try to reach her and see if I can find out. Okay. Okay. Um, one possibility is that if we don't have that answer, should we move on? Ken Russell seems to understand. Yes. Because Yvonne emailed some things to Jamie. Yeah. And I, did, did we get an, an email from Yvonne about updated language? Oh, uh, we did. You did. From Jamie forwarded it to all of us. Oh, okay. Oh, she forwarded it. Yeah. Oh, Yvonne is here. Fabulous. I don't think I have it, so. Thank you so much. Oh, okay. Got you. So this is the change language. Okay. Okay. So thoughts on the charge of this committee? I'm sorry, but uh, is it short enough that you could read it? I think so. I can try to be quick. It's not terribly long. Um, the So this is as um, proposed um, from the head of the Community Justice uh, Committee, as well as um, our uh, and Jamie. Um, I'm not sure what Jamie's real title is. Assistant Administrative. To the city manager. Assistant to the city manager. There we go. Okay. Uh, so the Montpelier Homelessness Task Force is charged with providing the city council with a report in three months that includes a uh, couple bullet points. Uh, one, creative, collaboratively developed. Uh, creative collaboratively developed uh, short-term ideas and or solutions to improve conditions for the homeless, and two, policy recommendations and concrete ideas for longer-term structural and systems improvement that the city could implement along with the, uh, with the preliminary budget and timeline for duration of work and implementation. And then also, um, ideas and recommendations um, should be supported by data that includes, and some more bullets, uh, inf one, information regarding the scope of homelessness in Montpelier and the needs of people experiencing homelessness in Montpelier. Two, the systems currently in place in our region to address homelessness. And three, uh, the range of concerns, perceived barriers, and potential solutions identified by the community. And four, existing strategies in other cities or states recognize, re recognizing that the location of our city requires solutions that are responsive to our changing seasons. So is that, does that help, Glenn? Thank you. Okay. Thoughts on that? Don? Well, I really like the changes. So thank you, Yvonne. Um, and I like the, the, the clear gold of three months. It's yeah. a really good target. I agree. Lauren? Um, I also like the charge and like that it's become more specific, which I think will help um, keep it focused and have a clear charge. Um, would this imply that it only exists for those three months and then we would look at the longer term recommendations and reassess if we need an ongoing task force or should we be clear about what the timeline of commitment for people who are um, expressing interest? That's a great question. Um, my instinct is to say uh, that we should assume that uh, we would reevaluate that question in three months and that that group can make some kind of a um, determination as to whether or not they would like to continue or if there's more need, which I mean, there's there going to be more need. Um, but in terms of like, have they accomplished their task and is there a different task perhaps that they would like to tackle? Right, they can evaluate perhaps at that time. Yeah, because it seems like at that point they would need a different charge. Right, yeah, I think that's fair. Or they might or recommend one. Yeah. Or amend 
but yeah. Exactly. Yeah, which right. is perfectly perfectly fine. Uh, Donna, do you have I something? I just wouldn't want to set it up to end in five, in three months. I guess I, I see it as a broader you know, group, and then all along the way you evaluate it. And three months is the goal to make the gold. <laughs> uh, Connor. Yeah, I, th I think you might like see the ten thousand foot view yeah. over these three months, and maybe there would be other like people who would sign up for it. That could really narrow in on the uh, you know, uh, more details of it. So. Uh, at the same time, I think that um, one of the parts, uh, sort of contrary to your 10,000 foot view, I, I think that's true that we would get that. Also, I like that uh, the first uh, focus point is uh, short term ideas and their solutions to improve conditions right now. And I think we can find some of those within that three months. Um, so I would say that's. Honestly, I think that that's more important to me than the 10,000 foot view for now. You know, in that, in light of that, I actually wonder if um, that first charge, you know, providing the city council with a report in three months that includes, you know, you know creative collaboration, cr um, collaboratively developed short term ideas, I mean, that, that really is a three month part. And then it, that second bullet, you know, policies about longer term structural changes, that could take more time. So I, I wonder if um, you know we should be looking for some short-term recommendations in three months, and then looking for some longer-term recommendations further out. Um, any I further comments about that from the council, Donna? I guess again I, I'm backing off from over micromanaging the group. Yeah. That if we set them up, I'm, I would say like a y okay. intention of a year appointment. Okay. Uh, if you need it. And then the, the goal is that in within three months, they can report where they are with those two major items. Yeah. And then they'll know what they can do and what they might decide a, a subgroup can do. You Fair. Know, can be, things could be broken up. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Steven. Uh, Steve Whitaker from up there. Uh, I remind you that I asked that this be started back in March. Now winter's approaching. And uh, they <laughs> we're kind of under the gun. I'd ask you to phrase your motion, whatever it is, or your purpose. I haven't seen that language. Uh, this is kind of awkward. I had offered some language. There's been a kind of a crowdsourcing refinement of language. But I think what you ought to do right now is leave it uh, to the bare minimum and make the first charge of the task force to refine what they feel they're going to be able to accomplish in a year and come back to you even at the next meeting with a refined scope. Give them a chance to meet, convene, assess the strengths and weaknesses of the group. And I also want to point out that one of the proposals was that there be a liaison, not necessarily a voting member uh, from Barry in Berlin. Uh, I understand that uh, Sergeant Bassett was willing to serve uh, as a liaison from Berlin, but I haven't been in touch with him. Um, I think it, this needs to happen in a greater area, but the primary focus, as I see it, is, is Montpelier right now, and not at the 10,000-foot level, at the 6-foot level for the next three months until winter hits and see what we can get done. But uh, ask that the task force come back with their own recommended scope, and I think it may even be as specific as writing a plan. Um, <coughs> Thank you. So uh, what would you like to do regarding the charge? Is there a motion regarding the charge of this group? Uh, Lauren. Well, so I'm just wondering, so we have the concept in the first bullet about developing short-term ideas and or solutions. I'm wondering if there's any I mean, not to overly wordsmith, because I agree that the committee should figure out exactly how this plays out. Um, but I'm just like, if we're looking for things that we want to get done for this this winter, like, is there any just more specificity or timeliness? I mean, short term could mean different things to different people. So if we if we're really looking for, are there solutions we need to get in place for this winter? Things like we knew the um, shelter closed when it was still really cold out this year. Things things like that that we'd want to get in place sooner rather than later if they're going to need funding and other things. So just does 
I don't know if we need any clarification or just having this conversation is enough to be like, we're looking for implementation and not just short-term ideas. Um, Maybe it's fine. No, I mean, <laughs> um, yeah, don't. I guess I'm, I'm hoping within their discussion, if there are things they can implement short-term or come to us to help, then that's what will come before us. I, I feel very comfortable making a motion that we adopt this as the initial charge to be revisited in three months when we get their report, but that this works for me for right now. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just works. Uh, Glenn. Um, Donna more or less took my points. Okay. Second it. All right. Was that a motion? Sorry. Yeah, that was a motion. Then second. Uh, okay. Can you pass some copies of that around? Um, I don't know if... Um, we yeah, we can make copies. some copies. Yeah. You don't have copies? No, um, it's all online. It's, and but that's what... That's what pass the first we line can, of it. We can really go. We've read it several times. The, the first line is creative collaborative, developed, short-term ideas and or solution to improve condition for the homeless. And the next gets into policy recommendations and concrete ideas for long-term structural and system improvements that the city could implement, along with a preliminary budget and timeline for the duration of work and implementation. Okay, and uh, so there's a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Any comments from the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Jack, and then we'll take any further comments from the public, yeah. I think this is specific enough to give the task force some guidance while being uh, broad enough to allow them to have the flexibility they need to move forward with take, to pursue the effort uh, in the way that their uh, thinking and discussion leads them. So I support this the way mm -hmm. it is. Further discussion? Yeah, Don. I just have a question for John. In looking at this, I was including in the overall, the, also the section that talks about ideas and recommendation, even though I didn't talk about that. Oh, yes. The memo has both sections, and I was including that. Is that what my seconder also thought, Glenn? Yes, okay. yes that's yeah, what no, I intended. Okay. Your, your, resolu your motion was fairly broad, so I, okay. I think it was inclusive. Yeah. Okay. That was my intention. Any further comments from the public about the charge of this group? Oh, yeah, go ahead. My name is Seth Collins. I'm from Berlin, Vermont. And I would suggest that this, uh, this task force work in the direction of implementing new construction projects of, uh, of, of units that are uh, that would either would be either rented for four hundred dollars per month since that's that's uh, that's a quite reasonable and also perhaps there would be something where either people could rent to own or there'd be like condominiums where you where you'd buy them outright and then if you were to move out you would then sell it back into the company because in my experience in most individuals it's uh it's the best way for them to settle down if they have a place that they either own themselves or if they're renting that's uh, safe and secure and affordable. Thank you. Thank you. I was just going to echo the point. Oh, if you would come up and use the microphone so that people um, who are viewing at home can, can also hear you. And also if you would say your name and where you live. Uh, I'm Bob Buchanan. I'm a professor at Goddard. I uh, have worked at uh, Good Samaritan Home. And I'll just echo the comments everyone else has offered, which is our timeline is not the timeline of the folks on the streets. They're in a much shorter, much more precarious, much more vulnerable timeline. So the sooner we can uh, work on this and identify short-term measures that will significantly improve the difficult situation so many people are in this fall, the better. Okay, so there has uh, been a, a motion and a second. Um, any further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, great, thank you. And so now on to um, appointments to this committee. So um, if there is uh, anyone here who had put their name in to be um, considered to uh, be officially appointed to this committee, though I want to um, 
Um, just remind people that they, these will be um, open meetings, so regardless of whether or not you're appointed uh, particularly to it, then you're, everyone is welcome. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, if you are here and want to introduce yourself and tell us about your interest in serving on this committee. So my interest, I'm Zach Hughes, Montpelier, Prospect Neighborhood. Um, my interest is because I, I'm out there every day um, when I can be, uh, besides my other job, and I uh, practically live this stuff. Um, so I have a lot of resource uh, and connection out there. And I have the ability to talk with, these, uh, with everybody out there at a unique level. So I'm... Uh, you know, I feel I'm uniquely suited for this. Plus, I'm not representing any interest at all, um, but the cities uh, and the city councils uh, and so on. Citizens of Montpelier mostly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Eric Corral from Moss Center for Independent Living. Um, even though I'm representing an organization, I'm actually representing uh, people with disabilities and the deaf. I work, I'm actually a person with a disability, and um, I really want to include not only people that have uh, mental health conditions, but people with other disabilities, mobility, cognitive, people that are deaf. And i am also been working as an advocate for people with disabilities for 15 years. So, like everybody else, I provide a unique um, set of skills to this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Dawn Little. I'm a Montpelier resident, and for the last four years, I've been doing street outreach in Washington County, primarily in Montpelier, Berlin, and Barrie. Um, I've worked a little bit with Sergeant Bissett and with Zach and a number of the agencies in the area, I do referrals, I do peer counseling, I get donations and pass out donations. I've been trying to identify some of the gaps in services, working primarily with people who have fallen through the gaps in the existing services, like people with trauma or mental health issues, people with addictions, people who are unable to get over most of the hurdles that are out there in accessing the services that are currently available. Um, so I would really like to be um, involved with the task force. Um, as Zach said, I think I have the ability to communicate with people who are, who have perhaps given up on accessing traditional services. Uh, I have the time to put in and reaching them. Um, so I'd really, I'd really like to do that. And I think it's really, was it Peter? who was talking about communication between existing services and the people who need them. And that's a very serious issue. Um, and that's one of my, my primary goals, so I would love to be part of that. Thank you. Could you say, say your name again? Yeah. Dawn Little. Dawn. Okay. Yeah, I don't know whether you have my name or not, because I just heard about this a short time ago. Okay. All right, thanks. Thank you. Gable, I'm actually a resident of Plainfield. Uh, oh, sorry. Is that I didn't want to shout. Is that better? <laughs> Tilt it up. Um, is this okay? Yes. Okay. Um, Rana Gable. I work in Montpelier in community mental health. I am not here representing any organization. I'm here as a concerned citizen. Um, I'm interested in identifying and filling gaps in services which are profoundly evident in this area and I think throughout the country, um, but profoundly evident here. Um, I do street outreach in my spare time and I would like to do what I can to help resolve this issue in a timely fashion. I'm primarily concerned with warming shelters, cooling shelters, Safe access to restrooms is a huge, I know that I have difficulty downtown sometimes <coughs> as someone with money in my wallet finding a restroom. Um, safe access to showers, laundry, um, and a housing first model I would love to see, but in the immediate future I would just like to help do whatever I can in a very solution oriented, timely fashion. So thank you. 
there are also a lot of people who um, whose lived experience qualifies them, and I am absolutely fine with not being nominated as well because I will continue to do what I do, and it's you know I have no attachment one way or the other. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Bob Buchanan, back again. I live in Marshfield. I work in Plainfield. Um, I'm just here really as a citizen. I've worked at Good Samaritan Home in May again. I teach at Goddard. I think about these issues all the time. I echo everything that Rana just said. She, uh, in particular, uh, that there are significant services that we do not have available to folks. And also, if folks with um, lived experience want to be on the committee, I'm happy to step away from that as well. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jonathan Goddard. I'm a resident of Berlin. I work here in Montpelier. Um, I'm interested in, uh, first of all, thank you all for taking the time to look at my application and to allow me to speak briefly about this. But. Um, so I'm interested in serving on the task force primarily because what we're really talking about here is human suffering and people that are not uh, that are not able to um, have basic needs met, being shelter. So I really want to um, be part of the conversation, part of the dialogue. I live very close to Montpelier, uh, just outside the town line. Um, so I would really appreciate the opportunity to try to work on this issue directly uh, as a member of this task force. And thank you for considering all the applications and mine as well. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Yep. Since he isn't here, this is Yvonne Bird. Um, from the Community Justice Center. He isn't here, but a man named Travis Hill has come to see me twice in the last couple of weeks. You might remember I introduced him to you two weeks ago when he was here. And he uh, is someone who has experienced homelessness, who's utilized the shelter at the Bethany Church, who has a strong connection with Another Way and folks on the street, and he would really like to be appointed to the committee. I think you've already heard from me enough. Uh, I have expressed some mild concern about, uh, in the context that it is inclusive and open meetings, uh, how many people are going to really uh, be required to get a quorum, and who, are, how many workhorses are going to really get the work done. I'm concerned about expanding it to 14, 15 people. Uh, from the context of just operational logistics. Um, uh, it's up to y'all to decide whether you're going to actually reach out and ask uh, Sergeant Bassett to ask Barry, Ber Barry City and Berlin to uh, join in these, pro these processes. I think they could learn a lot and begin to form their own uh, task force based on this model. Um, I believe uh, I have not, I don't know all the people that have uh, have applied, so uh, I have made my own short list as you received earlier, um, and I welcome participation by, you know, any number of people, and it's more of a, a logistical thing of uh, effective management of a quorum in minutes and, and delegation to get the the requirement of data collection uh, I'm not sure who's got all that data I'm hoping city staff has some of it already but if you have any questions for me no? okay thank you Is anyone else here from that list okay 
Um, so I believe at the last meeting we uh, established that uh, um, that there were what eight seats or was it nine? I forget. I think it was. Bill said I said eight last time. Yeah. So I thought it was eight. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So um, fair enough. Uh, let's. I, I think we probably need to. I think we could. Um, and also, I mean, we're creating this from scratch right now. So uh, other comments. Uh, Peter, do you have something to add? Yeah, because I, I hear you. Peter Kalman, I hear you talking about the numbers. Yeah. And the point about quorum and is very important. I was on the, um, I can't even remember the name, the Social and Economic uh, Responsibility Committee. And... It's really important, first of all, to have an odd number, I think. <laughs> um, and are you counting a, 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 a member of the council in that number? Because it wasn't clear in our committee whether or not that person was counted. So I, my, my understanding is that, it'll be, that it would be eight um, with a council member. Who would be a voting member? Who would be a voting member? That's my understanding. B Bill's looking mean, skeptical. No, I, I, I don't. I, I, I wasn't clear whether you meant eight plus a council member to make it nine. Yes. Or, yes, that's yes. what you meant. Yes, that's. Yes. yes. Okay. And will there be a staff person who will support? Most likely, yes. Okay, because yes. that, that's critical. That'd be okay, that's all I want to say. Perfect. Thank you, <laughs> Peter. I should just say, in general, you know, there's there's all these committees that the city has that have. Uh, council representatives on the committee and the uh, as a general proposition if a member of the council is part of that committee then they're fully part of the committee including have being a voting member is it as brief yeah yeah very okay. brief yeah. Uh, I did have a discussion with uh, councillor Hurl regarding that I think that especially as I've watched CVPSA I believe that one, the availability of the available time of the volunteer council members has been a, uh, a challenge, uh, especially leading up to this appointment. Uh, I would recommend that you put two councilors on it, but in, in non-voting positions. That way they can come and go as they please and they don't count towards the quorum. And, uh, but they also don't, uh, well, I, I believe that there's merit to having a tight team of workhorses to get this job done. And if counselors have, are spread too thin on other projects, that would dilute that effort. Thank you. Okay, um, so I, we would be discussing this in executive session. So is there a motion to go into executive session? Uh, Don, or Glenn? Before that, one other point that I feel like we might want to mention is that uh, in earlier conversations about this, we had expected to get a member of this task force uh, recommended from the Montpelier Business Association, mm -hmm. since, uh, as I recall, the whole thing came up mm -hmm. to some extent from that source. Uh, has there been any more recent communications so from them? I understand that they are planning to nominate someone. I don't know that they have actually selected the person yet. Um, we're gonna we're gonna keep going. Um, just, just Jen from uh, Rebel Heart did offer to okay. participate. She Thank wasn't you. nominated by the business okay. association. Um, any further things that we need to discuss? Okay, is there a motion? Pursuant to. 1 VSA section 313A sub 3. I move that we enter into executive session to discuss the appointment of a public officer or officers. Is there a second? Second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, we'll be back uh, hopefully soon. Okay, is there a motion to come out of executive session? So moved. Second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Is there a motion uh, regarding the appointments? I move that we appoint to the Homelessness Task Force the following people.
Travis Hill, Erica Real, Don Little, Ken Russell, Zach Hughes, Will Eberly, and Stephen Whitaker. Second. Uh, so further discussion. Um, before we go too much further on this, I just want to um, point out that um, you know one of the factors in here for us was uh, the um, residency of uh, people who were um, applying for it. And even though um, a number of people who were not appointed um, don't live in Montpelier but have some connection either uh, through work or or, or uh, whatnot, would absolutely uh, invite you all to continue to um, pay attention to the notices, uh, the, the warnings for these meetings, and um, still uh, certainly invite you to uh, come participate um, uh, in these discussions. That's um, going to be really important. Um, uh, so, any further discussion? Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, thank you. And uh, I, oh, yes, uh, Donna. I would like to <clears throat> make a motion to appoint Glenn as a council representative on this committee. Second. Uh, Glenn, how do you feel about that? Are you willing to I serve? think it's great. Okay. I'd love to serve. Uh, and I also really appreciate how much interest there's been on this. I think it's one of the, uh, the largest uh, and fastest group of applicants that I've seen. And I, um, I look forward to working hard on this committee. Uh, if I get voted on. <laughs> all right. Um, all in favor? Oh, actually, further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? OK. Thank you all, and thank you for um, the work that you're, you're going to do. I'm looking forward to that report in uh, three, about three months. So thank you all. And in terms of uh, Yvonne Bird is going to arrange for the first meeting, so she'll be reaching out to people. OK. Um, it is eight o'clock. Um, actually, let's let's keep going um, for now. And if we need to take a break, we certainly can. Um, okay. So the Berry Street Main Street corridor discussion. Um, yes. Welcome. Hello. So uh, do you yeah. want to um, introduce sort of what, what we've um, been looking at t so far today, or for, um, for this item, yeah? Yeah, I just, before we started, I just wanted to announce that um, we heard just this morning that uh, we were awarded a, a grant to construct sidewalk on Granite Street. Um, oh, wonderful. So I know a lot of people were interested in that connection, so something to look forward to um, next summer. Um, and actually, it's through the same program that funded um, this study. So there's a the segue. Um, on, uh, in April, the council received a presentation on the draft scoping study. Um, since that time, VTrans has uh, reviewed and commented on that study, on that draft. Um, their comments and questions uh, have been addressed. Um, we also held two uh, public outreach meetings. Um, I want to thank the library and the senior center uh, for hosting those. I think they're very well attended. Um, saw some council members there. The mayor did a great job of leading those. Sophie did a great job of presenting. Um, you know, it really, you know, we got a lot of good feedback, and I think it um, really spurred some conversation about. Um, alternative transportation accommodations, over parking accommodations, and people's experience out on the corridor now, people's past experiences with um, roundabouts and signals and, and different bike facilities. Um, so yeah, it, 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 was, it was very uh, very well attended, very, very good conversations to have. Um, and that's, so I guess, kind of why we're here this evening, um, to have those conversations now at the council level. Um, you know, those, they were, uh, you know, those meetings were recorded. They were available online. Um, you know, maybe you saw some things, heard some things that you wanted to talk further about. Uh, maybe you've heard some things from your constituents outside of those meetings that, that you wanted to bring up. Um, you know, staff has presented uh, some recommendations. Um, I can just quickly go through those. Uh, we kind of divided them up into uh, Berry Street recommendations, intersection recommendations, and, uh, and Main Street 
um, bike facility recommendations. Um, you know, for the, so for the, the Berry Street recommendation, um, staff would recommend to move forward with a short-term uh, implementation of a two-way uh, bicycle um, a bike track, I think you call it, um, on the south side of the street, um, working towards a long-term goal of um, constructing a, an actual extension of the shared use path on that same side, on the south side. Um, for the, the intersection treatments, um, staff, uh, the preferred alternative with staff is the M1 alternative, and that would be the, the signalization of the um, corridor with the, um, with the implementation of adaptive technology uh, to adjust the signals in real time, as well as the um, exclusive PED phases, which all of our existing signals have now, stopping all traffic for pedestrians. Um, the uh, the other alternative, so so the M1 alternative is the signalization of the corridor. Uh, we do recognize that the uh, roundabout option at School Street um, has doesn't have the constraints that some of the other locations do in terms of constructing roundabouts. Um, I think we made the comment of potentially doing some tweaks. You know, it, it does queue through that intersection sometimes. It's it's minimal. Um, maybe there's some some tweaks of the existing signal infrastructure at the the State Street that can be done to minimize that. I don't think it can remove it completely, but but minimize it. Um, the Main Street. Uh, bike facility recommendation would be um, implementing the uh, the unprotected lanes with the buffers and working towards the uh, the protected lanes. Um, and again, and 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 with the the main street bike facility recommendation and the uh, the Berry Street recommendation, we've also noted that um, you know the parking removal. Um, to accommodate those is a separate process, and ultimately the council would see that um, that ordinance change um, separate from from this scoping study. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's all I have. Super, thank you. Uh, so I'd love to start with um, some if there's any questions uh, or comments from um, council, um, and then hear from the public on this. Um, the way that I'm thinking about it, just so you all are aware, is it feels like there are uh, at least six different um, uh, places or items on which we need to make a decision. Intersection of Barry and Main Street, intersection of State and Main. Um, what are the, what should be the bike pen amenities on Barry Street, um, the school and Main Street intersection, and then um, the bike pen amenities on Main Street. Is that, is that a fair summation? I mean, so the, the M1 um, suggestion had multiple parts or intersections as a part of it, so I'm sort of breaking those out a little bit. Um, the other thing that I want to just make a note of is that this is a, this is an, a really interesting agenda item, I would say, because the uh, staff and um, uh, consultants have recommended um, one course of action, and uh, the MTIC has basically recommended a different course of action, and so um, this is. Uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting um, conundrum. So um, mostly because there's that conflict, um, I would love to just see where people are at uh, this evening and see if there is um, a general consensus about anything. Um, and then it seems like we should probably, there, there may be items that we just need to talk more about. Um, because some of these items, it feels like some of these are too big a decision to, um, uh, just move move forward, you know, um, if there's not um, substantial agreement. Um, I guess I'll just say that. Um, or I'd, I'd prefer, anyway, for there to be a substantial agreement. I don't know if we're going to get there, uh, but at, at least I'd like to start with um, just seeing where uh, where people are at. So, f so first thing, um, any um, questions or um, comments on, on any of this? Uh, Connor, then Glenn. So the removal of parking, parking would need to be approved separately, but aren't they completely like intertwined at the same time? Some of these plans. Yeah, we would. I, I, th I think where we what we would do is um, sort of approve what our vision is uh, for moving forward, and then the actual implementation would require 
um, ordinance changes uh, regarding um, where parking was, or, or how parking is, is allotted through uh, the town. Does that make sense? So there's, there's the, but even if we deal with the parking at a later time, we can still talk about, you know, what's, what's the vision, what's the big picture. Okay. Yeah, I think that, I'm sorry, I think yeah, that's what we're after is, is the vision, um, especially when it comes to the parking. It's something that staff can move forward with or committees can move forward with. Um, you know, maybe that, that parking um, is approved to be removed through this, but um, it just may not be palatable right now. Um, so then that would allow staff to um, move forward with, you know, uh, programs like the micro pro, micro transit program, or you know, a garage, or, you know, something that takes that demand off the on street parking. So, I, I agree. That's what we're looking for is kind of the vision right now. Go ahead. Um, I have a, a few questions, uh, and I'm totally willing to be interrupted with other questions. Uh, but, um, kind of on the the parking question, one of the the things that I heard come up at the public hearing, the one that I managed to get to, um, was uh, a kind of general question about uh, bike paths on streets and whether it was practical to consider uh, seasonal bike paths uh, and replacing parking when uh, fewer people are likely to be biking. has. DPW talked internally at all about that possibility, or do you have any any uh, suggestions in that direction at this point? Um, it hasn't been addressed specifically with this scoping study. Um, you know, I know there's some there's some issues with conflicts of, of markings and, and signage and things like that when you when you switch things over, um, but again, it hasn't been addressed. Specifically with this. Okay. Um, next question. One of the uh, the ideas that is also potentially a little bit outside the scope of the current study, but uh, something that I'm personally attached to is is changing the the Memorial Drive and Main Street intersection to a roundabout. Um, and I'm curious to hear. Uh, so, if if we signalize the Barry and Main Street intersection, does that make it harder to, in the future, turn the Memorial Drive Main Street intersection into a roundabout? Is that something you can speculate on? Um, so, so that particular option was um, presented through the M two alternative. Um, that included the roundabouts at every intersection okay. down Main Street. Um, I think it was it was stated in there that because I, I believe M three or M four was kind of what you're talking about, kind of a, a, a you know mix matching of signals and, and roundabouts throughout the corridor. Um, it was found to be the not impossible, but it was found to, to be the least efficient way to do it, um, with the roundabouts at every intersection being basically the most efficient and second would be the signals that so when you start mixing and matching you're losing efficiency of the corridor basically. can I jump in here um, uh, when you say efficiency do you mean in terms of moving cars yes through the intersection right okay. yeah okay thank you and I think that actually answered the next question that I had <laughs> so thanks and then um, On the uh, the adaptive uh, signals, um, or no, I guess it's actually on the the, the uh, exclusive <coughs> pedestrian phase for for signalized intersections. Do you have any data comparing the the relative safety of that scenario versus, for example, roundabouts for pedestrians? And the reason I'm curious about this is. Um, the intersection that I use most, again, is the Memorial, uh, Memorial and Main Street intersection. I walk across it multiple times a day. Um, the, the exclusive pedestrian phase is good. Uh, at the same time, uh, probably about once a day, uh, I 
I get to my phase, my pedestrian phase, and uh, a car pulls up in the turning lane and does not see the, the no turn signal come on and comes fairly close to, to running into me as I step out into the street um, because they're looking for oncoming traffic from the other direction. Uh, so it, yes, it's a, it's a protected pedestrian phase. It never feels perfectly safe to me and I tend to feel safer in roundabouts where uh, I'm only crossing one lane at a time and I can always see and everyone seems to be looking in the, in the proper direction to see uh, uh, potential conflicts. Uh, I, I think I rambled through that question, but I is there any data comparing those two safety levels for pedestrians? So we actually I mean, we had this kind of same conversation, not just with the, the pedestrian safety, but the um, pedestrian convenience as well, kind of bundling that together into roundabouts versus traffic signals. Um, and you can read one study that says it really it kind of comes down to personal preference. Um, you know, you can read one study about one and then another about the other, and they contradict each other. So, um, I think earlier on when roundabouts were kind of just coming to the area, um, you could make a case for um, signals being safer. But now that they're kind of more prevalent around here and people know how to use them more, um, you know, they really even out. Um, and the same thing with convenience. Um, you know, with a roundabout, you're going a little bit off your path um, and then coming back instead of with a traffic signal. Yes, you have to wait for your turn to go, and there's some patience involved with that, but you have kind of a straight line of, of where you're going. Um, so really, I, th I think they kind of cancel each other out. Um, and again, it's more per uh, personal preference than, than anything. Yeah. Um, just to add to that, um, it cancels itself out unless you're visually impaired, then the traffic um, signals are safer from that perspective because there is a exclusive phase. People are obligated to stop, whereas in a roundabout, it's a yield situation. So people slow down, yes, but not necessarily always stop. So in that sense, it's that is a another um, conversation. Um, I, I guess. Uh, the other thing where, the, the, where the, the pedestrian safety comes into play is where you start to kind of uh, co-mingle um, at the roundabouts with, if, if bikes need to kind of co-mingle with pedestrians um, to get out of the roundabout and maneuver around it. Um, you know, it also presents a safety factor for pedestrians. Was that it? Okay, Donna. I know I'm redundant, but yes, I want roundabouts, and you really do need either all roundabouts or all light signals. And I understand and know that it was a hard decision, even for the staff, to look at. But even beyond that, I would like to discuss the shared path that we have now that we're connecting that comes down past the railroad tracks and hits Barry at the uh, recreation building, comes back out to Barry Street. And to me, it's a shared path that bikes and pedestrians are using. And so I would like to make sure that it continues with a shared path usage down the south side of Barry Street, and then goes across that intersection of Barry and Main and joins the other shared path. Now, temporarily, you've put here a two-way bike. You talked about just temporarily putting something in. So the pedestrians would stay up on the sidewalk on Barry Street but below them would be two lanes for bikes. And that's okay temporarily, but what I don't see here is saying it's gonna go back long-term to a shared path because it's only a small section of Berry Street. And to me, it's more confusing when you change it than if you just continue the same shared youth path that pedestrians and bikes use. Is that the intention? Yeah, it's just so not that, stated yeah, here. No, it was yeah, addressed. Um, in the recommendations, um, alternative B1, a shared use path as the long-term long -term goal for the, for the Barry Street connection. The B2 is, the, like you mentioned, the, the short-term um, two-way bikeway, and then the B1 alternative <laughs> is that shared Take use. me what section, because they're not numbered. Um, so I have sta the- Staff recommendations. Right up top, you have a B2, but that 
talks about. And then next two line ways. down, it start. It talks about the B1 alternative. This doesn't describe it. Okay, it, it looked confusing to take the report we had before with lots of lanes and diagrams and just have the narrative. But thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that was also part of it. Is if indeed we accept this, then staff is going to start moving on this. It isn't a matter of us accepting the report and then considering policies. This becomes policy. Is that correct? Um, so the way we kind of the way these usually kind of work out is um, at the end of the report there is a municipal um, recommendation or recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, that is what staff would pursue. Okay. Um, I had a conversation with VTrans about potential next steps. Um, you know, typically you, you take a report like this and um, you, you have a number of alternatives and you narrow it down to one and then you would go apply for design and construction funding for that for that alternative um, so ultimately ideally that's what we're after okay I just want to make sure that we know when we vote for it that's what we're, we're setting a policy right yep. okay so just two more other things um, it, at one of the public hearings seasonal biking came up at the other it didn't and again I feel if we're trying to get bikes out there we could should have the paths there, they should be theirs year round. And that's the way we expand more bikes and less cars. Uh, and now on School Street, I'm really disappointed not to have a roundabout there, but I really understand it won't work with the lights. Will the construction make it narrower? Right now, it's a, we talked about it. One thing the roundabout would do at school in Maine would make the whole intersection smaller. So will the pedestrians still have to walk this long distance so that the light for pedestrians will be longer? I think there's some opportunities there, either with the roundabout option or the signal option, to shorten those, um, create some larger Even with outs. the signal, you would shorten yeah, I, it? I, I think there's some opportunities there to, to okay, do that. Okay, because that was one of the issues, and I didn't see it addressed here. But. Yeah, um, and I don't, I don't think, it, it's not necessarily, um, at least you know, I'm just speaking for staff, staff's mm -hmm. position that um, a roundabout won't work there. Um, you list lights there for are it. less There are less impacts there, and I yeah. think we, we listed that um, as part of the recommendations. Is you know it, it doesn't have the constraints that the other locations have. Um, there is some queuing that happens through the intersection, but it's minimal compared to um, some of the other ones. Okay, I'm in the queue a lot, way down to the other roundabout. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, I want to uh, follow up on some of the questions you asked. Uh, so you were in favor of a uh, uh, shared use path on the south side of Berry Street, uh, but also roundabouts. And my understanding was that those two things, that there was no plan that included both of those things. Like if we were going to have the shared use path on the south side of Berry Street, that would necessitate signalization at Berry and Main. Um, unless I'm wrong, and, and well, I'm happy no. to be wrong. Well, there yeah, was yes. a, a diagram that wasn't shown at the at the at the two public hearings you attended that was shown at the other public hearings, and it allowed for the shared youth path to come down Barry on south side, but it would make the bikes and pedestrians who are together go across Barry Street. So they'd have one more street crossing. Was and the consultants didn't like that. They, they didn't present it at the hearings you had. Wait, I'm, I'm sorry. Can you say that again? It would, it would cross. So wouldn't so, that be on the north side of Barry Street? Yeah. So you're on the south side. Yeah, of Barry Street. So you're by the dry cleaners when yeah. you get there. Yeah. Pedestrians and bikes get there together. Yeah. You'd have to cross Barry Street and then and Main. cross Main and, and then, join the path. Well, and then you'd also have to cross the access road to behind Right, Obershots. right, right. So, so you, you end up with you end three. Up with three crossings. One more. One more crossing. Okay. Yep. Yeah, and that's... It's yeah, two yeah. more crossings. Two more crossings. Right, two more crossings. Because um, behind the yeah. And that's with the um, that's with the mini roundabout option. Um, mm -hmm. With the full roundabout option at that intersection, you could you could still reduce it to one crossing. Yeah. Um, but because of the location of the railroad tracks, you can't have a crossing on a railroad track, so it it creates those extra crossings. So so that is possible. To do a south side of Barry with Street. a full roundabout, it is possible to um, continue along the south side and only have that one crossing. And only have one, oh, and only have one crossing. But you, but we could have the south side of Barry Street mostly, and then cross Barry, cross Main, cross the um, Obershans. I, I don't want to call it that, um, 
but next to the railroad. But um, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you. It's helpful. Um, other comments or questions? Oh, Connor, do you have something to add? Um, Jack. I, I do have a couple. Um, I'm uh, with, with this regard to the School Street in intersection. I still think the uh, roundabout is a preferable option to uh, to signals. Um, I'm not really sure I understand why that's not seen as a feasible option We're, since it's beyond, there are no signals beyond that, so it's not going to uh, interfere with outer traffic flow is uh, am I missing something um, no I mean I, I think we we stated that where it's you know the signal um, but you know, the roundabout option like you said it doesn't present those efficiency constraints it doesn't present those route those right-of-way constraints um, so you know, we went with the overall M1 alternative, which signalizes that intersection. But I think it's staff's feeling that if a roundabout were to go in there, it would have minimal impacts on on those. Um, I also really find the idea of the uh, of having a roundabout intersection at Memorial Drive to be very appealing. Um, and I envision this kind of like the, I know some people who drive in that intersection find it threatening, but I envision it like the, the roundabout on the north end of uh, Brattleboro, right off uh, exit three from, uh, from the interstate. And although there's a lot of traffic that goes through, I think it moves traffic through very uh, quickly and efficiently. The one question that has always been in my mind with regard to doing the uh, turning that into a roundabout is how do we get there from here given the fact that there's so much traffic that goes through that uh, intersection every day I wonder if you have some thoughts about that um, how, do, how do we how do we turn that intersection into a roundabout and what what happens to all that traffic um, want to comment? <laughs> um, we all go on vacation. I guess I'm still a little stumped on the actual qu on the question. Um, Constructability-wise, or yeah, uh, construction. What what's happening to the traffic while that while that intersection isn't open to traffic because we're building a roundabout in that spot? Uh, that was that was something that was brought up among staff as well, not just with that intersection, but roundabouts in general. Uh -huh. um, and even getting past the, the building of it, which is a major major step, but just the maintaining of them, if, if you go to pave it, if you go to even just paint markings, um, if you have a water line break underneath it, you know, the roundabouts do pose some difficulties um, because you only have that one lane. So having adjacent streets to detour traffic to um, would be an option. Um, you can usually work within a roundabout and keep one side open so you don't have to detour both or all Very approaches. Um, it's basically, it comes down to just one approach that you have to detour onto a side road or an adjacent okay. street. Um, another issue that isn't addressed that uh, that I've had in my own mind as an issue for the main and state intersection, I've had had other people heard other people mention it is that uh, northbound traffic that try who wants to turn left onto uh, Langdon Street is often blocked because southbound traffic on Main Street pull up into the in across Langdon Street and block Langdon Street and yeah. that happens every day and it forces uh, traffic back into uh, into the State Street intersection. Um, would, would we need to uh, 
to, if we want to stop that, would we need to adopt an ordinance that says you're not allowed to uh, stop in that intersection, or could we do uh, pavement markings or something like you see in other places where uh, they've got these crisscross uh, markings to say don't stop here? Because uh, I think that that, no matter what we're doing with the intersections, that is going to continue to be a serious problem unless we address it. Um, so if you, well, when it gets light out, if you look out the front door, um, we just recently did um, that type of marking in front of the fire station. I just noticed that yeah, today. So it, it, it could be something similar to that. And I don't believe it is um, an ordinance uh, in our in our books. It's um, sort of at the discretion of, of staff to to place that. But uh, if someone, if, if a southbound driver pulls up uh, and blocks Langdon Street, are they violating an ordinance now, or do, do, would we need to adopt an ordinance to make it so that can be enforced and people can be ticketed for doing that? Yep. Uh, you think they're already violating some ordinance? Um, they may be violating state statute. Um, if they are, um, and they are cited for it, unfortunately, that that money doesn't come to the city, it goes to the state. So, uh, adopting a local ordinance to support that mm -hmm. um, would that probably make some sense. Okay, I'd, I'd be interested in pursuing that. Um, I realize this is beyond, somewhat beyond the scope, but the other terrible intersection that we have downtown is the Elm Street and State Street intersection. And I noticed one of the comments from the Department of Transportation is, how come you're not talking about addressing that at all? Um, I think we really should be. That might be the next. Well, I think there's phase. some hope um, that the, um, the, the State Street streetscape plan and master plan could um, maybe address mm -hmm. some some fixes at that intersection. It's within the, the okay. scope of that Thanks. study. And if I'm if I'm being redundant, let me know. But with regard to the School Street roundabout, are you saying that ev even if we adopt the plan the way it is, that leaves us open the opportunity to do the state the School Street roundabout, or should we vote to change something in this to make that uh, the option? I, I I would vote to change that if you wanted the, the school street I would okay. pull that out and do a separate okay thanks okay any further comments uh, just initially here I'm, I'd love to come back for more discussion about this um, but I, I'd also love to hear from the public um, on this as well um, so yeah go ahead Good evening, Joe Castellano. And I um, have to say I'm in favor of the staff recommendations for the M1, the signalized intersections. And I like the idea of the seasonal bike path on the south side of Barry Street. I think that uh, bike usage during the winter is not as robust as during the summer. And I think it could free up some parking or uh, just pro provide better sight lines uh, through the winter, you know, when visibility is not so good. And one of the reasons why I'm in favor of the signalizing intersections as opposed to the roundabouts is uh, it's challenging as it is right now just getting out of that Shaw's parking lot and as winter's coming and approaching and it's dark, just trying to turn left out of that lot, I think the traffic volume is going to increase or the speeds might increase with the roundabout, making it more difficult to get out of the Shaw's parking lot. And the same reason for the school street, um, the reason why I never park on those diagonal parking spots in front of the library is I'm always afraid if I'm next to a big F-150 pickup, I can't see and I might run into somebody. So I'm just always, just from a safety perspective, um, you know, not, that's the concern I have because some people can come into a roundabout and just, you know, although it may be a 25 mile an hour speed limit, some people will not adhere to that. So that's my concern is just from a safety perspective. Steve Whitaker. A couple of comments. Uh, I'm, I think we need to be very careful here because one of the key uh, qualities of our experiences in this town 
our smallest capital city is its walkability and adding signalization to multiple new intersections is going to put a big dent in that uh, perception both locals and tourists uh, that's a magic it's an intangible of how nice our town is um, I'll note that I'm, I'm going to haphazardly vote for the school street roundabout I'm going to vote against moving the crosswalk as it did get any mention here but there's talk of moving the crosswalk from the down home to city center over to the Hazen place uh, which is basically the back entrance uh, alley between Bethany Church and the AT&T store. Uh, that doesn't work from a traffic flow, from a people's, uh, from a pedestrian flow point of view. And I think that crosswalk where it is can actually help contribute to the pre preservation of the blocking, the uh, trying to prevent blocking of the Langdon Street. It could be part, that crosswalk could be one of the boundaries of the crisscross box that uh, protects the left turn lane from northbound traffic onto Langdon. Um, I'm not sufficiently schooled in the roundabout options for uh, Memorial Drive, but I, that is the preferred alternative. I do want to make a comment about the crosswalks. The, we've got one crosswalk there that talks to you and it uh, the flashing lights, I'm glad those don't exist at our other crosswalks down at school and, and Langdon, but the flashing, uh, I've had conversations with the folks who speak uh, Hindi or Canada, a Hindu dialect. We got a whole lot more people than the Spanish. I don't know who chose the languages for that crosswalk, but uh, maybe we don't need any talking crosswalks. Uh, I'd also remind you to consider the idea that was put on the table. I've reached out to the, that architect, that blind architect, uh, who did the 60 minutes piece. A as we design our intersections and our sidewalks, if we had uh, a sensitivity that could really benefit us going forward as we replace our sidewalks incrementally uh, with navigation uh, supporting the sight impair. Um, so just be really careful with this. I don't. I, I hope we're not jumping off a cliff tonight with uh, irreversible decisions. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, just in regards to the seasonal. No, um, okay. No, Donna mentioned it. And, um, it's okay. Just, just hang on one second. Yeah, I'm go sorry, go ahead. I'm, yeah. I'm, okay. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll be very quick. But my name is Seth Collins. I live in Berlin, Vermont. And I, I walk a lot. And it's I find it very difficult to cross or roundabouts directly as if as if they were, you know, cutting directly through them. So I would recommend, I mean, roundabouts are fine. They increase travel flow. But I would recommend that crosswalks be, were to be placed between them. So say you have a, a roundabout here, a roundabout here, and the crosswalk is there, then the traffic, because it would average out, because instead of the, the traffic stopping at, at the intersections, they're now roundabouts, and the traffic would then stop between them. So th uh, thank you. Thank you. I forgot one more important point. The, uh, this morning, I witnessed and photographed a semi-truck, a through truck coming down Main Street is apparently using probably illegal using Loomis as a shortcut probably to avoid the Main Street roundabout coming down Loomis turning right on school turning left on onto Main uh, but we have to be careful if the, we do have these tractor trailers coming through if they're gonna start violating and running on pet residential streets in order to avoid the roundabouts uh, that has to be taken into the calculation Thank you. any further comments do you have anything you want to add? Um, just in regards to the uh, seasonal. Do you have anything you want to add? Um, the seasonal aspect of it, um, you know, it, it's not mentioned in here, but if that is something that the council would like to, uh, would like staff to keep in mind as these design alternatives are, are being, uh, going through the process, um, it would just be something I would recommend adding to your recommendation, whether you'd like to pursue seasonal or, or full. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and just say what, I, what I'm thinking about all of this. And um, 
so I'm going to be, uh, again, a little methodical about this. Um, starting with, um, well, really with the staff recommendation, I, I'm in support of, of signalizing um, the, uh, the corridor generally. Um, and part of that is, it's really for a couple of reasons. One um, is that I, I agree that our walkability as a town is a uh, high priority. And I worry that roundabouts are not as pedestrian friendly um, as um, as you know w as we are accustomed to now um, in terms of um, getting ac around town, um, and that uh, there you know there is a real issue there with uh, the the sight impaired. The other um, the other reason is well and well so the the sort of the flip side of that too is that it is not a necessarily a priority for me to move cars more quickly. I mean, I mean, I know that would be nice, but as a as a community, that's not my highest priority. My highest priority is the walkability of the city. Um, the second thing, uh, second reason is that um, the uh, if if we're going to do roundabouts throughout, I'm very much I'm speaking for myself here, and I can be outvoted. But um, I'm very much opposed to a roundabout at the intersection of State and Main um, because of the uh, traffic implications um, for people coming down East State Street wanting to turn left. There was no way to do that without um, significant detours, and I think that would be very problematic for some of the side streets that would end up seeing much more um, traffic, and that would actually exacerbate the problem on Elm Street as well, because that's actually part of the, um, one of the solutions was to get people um, actually around to, to Elm Street to end up coming back around to Maine um, from East State, which is that, I, I think that would be very cumbersome. Um, Part of me would like to support some kind of a hybrid, only maybe that's not terribly efficient, but maybe uh, maybe if efficiency of cars is not my highest priority anyway. Um, but there it is. Uh, and then um, uh, the other uh, factor there, um, I'm forgetting my thought there, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going. Um, so in terms of, uh, Oh, right, so in, in terms of the, the hybrid um, sort of model, I, it, it did sound to me like a, a, a roundabout at uh, School Street and Main Street um, would be possible and not have uh, tons of impact, so I would, I would support that. Um, in, a par in part, I, I also want to favor the roundabout at Memorial and Main Street. That seems somehow intuitive to me, I, and I know that that's, um, uh, you know, a place, Glen, where you cross often, uh, and so I don't know how that works, but it also feels uh, um, slightly further away from um, downtown, so does, is that where, um, uh, you know, it'd be okay to, to have cars moving more quickly, um, I don't know. Um, I, anyway, I would, I would be interested in that, and I wonder if that makes a difference because it's on the end. Um, yeah, uh, in terms of uh, uh, state and Maine, I guess I'm, I'm being redundant here. Um, you know, interested in um, I'm signalizing it. I'm one of the highest priorities that I have is keeping the bike. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the shared use path um, on the south side of Berry Street, um, regardless of whether it's a roundabout or a signal at. Um, Berry Street and Main Street, um, having that on the south side of, of Berry Street, I think, makes the most sense, um, particularly for parking, uh, as well as, I mean, it'd be great if we could have one crossing um, across to, uh, uh, across Main Street there. Um, but again, regardless of what happens with the intersection, if we could keep that on the south side, that'd be wonderful. Um, Main, the, the, um, bike ped facilities or really the, the bike facilities on Main Street, I feel like I need to dig into that more. Um, I feel like I need, like we've had almost no conversation about what should be happening um, with bicyclists on Main Street and so I, I would not feel comfortable making a very clear decision about what we do there. I mean, I would love to dig into the, um, the report further and ask some, some more questions, but uh, for whatever reason that particular aspect is 
in my mind, low on the priority list of like what happens with these other intersections. Um, so maybe that's just we've just paid less attention to that aspect of it. Um, anyway, I'd like to revisit that at some point. Um, I do favor uh, moving the crosswalk um, uh, from Langdon Street to Hazen Place just to get a little separation there. Don't have strong feelings about that. I'm open to conversation about that. Um, anyway, and, and I'll, I guess I'll say that generally speaking. This is where I'm at right now, uh, and I would love to have more dialogue and just hear from others as to where you're at. And we, I, I don't anticipate necessarily having a, a, a vote tonight. Um, we could, but uh, I just want to put it out there that we don't, we don't have to, because these are big decisions. And if there's something that we all feel comfortable with on, on some aspect of it, then great, let's do it. Um, but otherwise, um, let's, like I want to make sure that you all know that I'm in a position where I'm still um, willing to talk. Um, you know, maybe, maybe these aren't the right um, solutions. I want to be open to discussion. Um, other thoughts, sorry, thank you for, entertaining me and letting me first. But also, Tom, you haven't spoken yet. Would you like to? Sure. Come, is, is that okay, Donna? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just feel like there's been a lot said about roundabouts not being safe for pedestrians, and that's just not true. Uh, and th there's just one city in Carmel, Indiana, who's called the USA Roundabout City. It has 100 roundabouts. Its population is 89,000. And they have right here, because of their aesthetics, and their ability to make it easier for pedestrian and bicyclists to navigate in, they have changed out all their intersections that used to be lights. So, and I'll get some more data on that, but there are other cities who've done this because it is safer, it is more attractive, it does slow down traffic, and anyway, so I just felt that was a misnomer. Fair, fair enough. Um, one of the things that, I, that would be helpful for me, Donna, is, um, well, this, this idea about, you know, what's, or I think it was uh, brought up by Seth, um, you know, what's the possibility of combining roundabouts with um, some kind of crosswalk? Yes, you yeah. can. Yeah. Anyway, I, I don't know, and maybe that's a, a question for you all. Um, what does that possibility look like? Okay, Tom. Are you commenting as a, a resident or? A <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> not yet, not yet. <laughs> well, I'm not the public works director anymore. And I'm not your boss. But I'm not a resident either. <laughs> but I still work here. <laughs> if you'd like to hear from me, I'd We'd I'll certainly offer like some to few hear comments. From you, please. Um, so the. the point about the, the roundabout um, pedestrian safety, I, I agree with you, Donna, there, there's a lot of, lot of uh, beneficial attributes Can you get closer to, to, Mike, Tom? to roundabout. So um, I think we've shown that at, at the school and main intersection, um, particularly with the younger um, kids and, and younger adults using that intersection frequently, that you do only have to look in one direction. Um, do you mean, and you it mean spring and main? Well, it's, spring you, you and main, spring what did I say? Um, so yes, so there there are some beneficial parts of, or attributes to, to pedestrian safety, and as far as the, the visually impaired, um, there is a um, for a two lane roundabout, uh, they recommend using what's called a Hawks system, uh, which is a signalized roundabout crossing, so that there's um, so there's a pedestrian actuated signal at the at the crossing, um, but even with that, for visually impaired, there there are systems you can use for locator tones. Um, and then there's a lot of training um, for um, helping, helping the visually impaired navigate roundabouts. They don't have the audible cues to, to locate the corners, that's all true, but there are other methods and systems to use for that. So um, I think as, um, I'll, I'll, if you don't mind, I'll, I just heard some things and I just wanted to, to clarify or add some, some thoughts on all of them. Um, one on the, just some clarity on the school in Maine um, roundabout idea, what we believe that is a, a realistic option, um, potentially a, a beneficial option. The, the issue there is um, kind of though to address some of the queuing and some of the issues that might cause a, a roundabout to fail. And when they fail, they fail completely. Uh, when, when queues of traffic back up through a roundabout, um, the side streets can't move, nothing moves really. So 
Um, how do you how do you address that? So that's why the the uh, um, looking at adaptive signal uh, technology is to is to is to detect when that cue is developing and then try to flush the intersection out. But that doesn't really work well when there's a crosswalk stuck in there or there's a truck maneuvering or somebody's backing out of a parking space. Um, so you can't totally overcome all of that. Um, but I think what we were looking at is maybe looking at it further, further study. Um, you talk about the obstruction of the Langdon Street intersection. Um, you know, we, our, our conventional solution to a lot of this, these issues was to add more lanes. Um, you, can't, you can't enter the right turn lane in front of the TD Bank because there's, there's angle parking in there. We could shorten that queue considerably if you double capacity. Um, two lanes side by side, a right turn lane and a, and a left and a through. And for going northbound, a separate lane left to turn, a holding lane to turn into to Langdon, and then a separate through lane. But now we have four lanes on Main Street and we're competing in this small piece of real estate for bike lanes and parking. So it's how you really allocate and break up this real estate and what, what gives and what, what sacrifices are we making. Um, State Street is a, is a conversation we had years ago about how long the right turn lane should be on State where the parklet is today. That lane was originally designed to go on the other side of the, of the bridge. Um, because of that lane um, not being long enough, and Sophie knows about calculating queue lengths and, and um, um, based on your right turn volume and your obstructions of the through lanes, can you use that lane? Well, your right turns you can't enter because they're, it's so um, backed by the through traffic, um, obstructed by the through traffic. So that's, that's really a deeper study. Um, that's why we're not eliminating the school main roundabout. It's that how do we overcome those constraints so a roundabout can actually work there. Um, and then the constructability side of things. It's a major transformation to turn a four-way conventional intersection into a roundabout with the splitter lanes, the splitter um, islands, and the center island. Drainage patterns are completely different. Your roads slope differently. You have a center high point rather than gutters in the side. So it's it's a significant cost, and there's major um, constructability issues. It's very disruptive. Um, roundabouts are an absolute bear to construct, as you pointed out, Jack. Um, it's it's doing them maybe in a, a quarter at a time while lanes are shifted and a lot of night work. Um, I think if you were to select a <clears throat> roundabout at, at Main Memorial, Route 2, 12 intersection, you probably, I wouldn't see it in my lifetime. Um, that's probably 10 years at best you'd see that because it really doesn't hit those warrants for congestion levels, traffic safety, um, pedestrian um, accidents. You really don't have any of those key indicators that says we need to advance this project for federal funding and state funding. So I just don't see that happening anytime soon, if, even if we could find a way to, to make it work. Um, that, that intersection is um, uh, optimized under the signal control, but if you look at the roundabout option, the, you have the river, a ledge, and a, and a gas station constricting that. So you think about how a truck might service the gas station um, with the roundabout and the driveway stuck right in there. Well, roundabouts need driveways separated a long ways away from them and need to be flat and need to be um, um, so that they are, um, I lost my train of thought. Um, the other important thing that I don't know that's fully mentioned in this is that roundabouts need relatively balanced flow to work because to enter um, one lane, there needs to be an obstruction caused by another entering vehicle. So when it's balanced, somebody's always getting the right of way because somebody's waiting. Um, so when you have side streets like school, um, school Street, I wonder if there's sufficient balanced flow there when one lane can actually dominate. And we see that sometimes at Route 2, 302 
intersection where there's um, I think it's the morning commute, you'll see a long queue uh, back out to Barrie because there's very little traffic exiting Montpelier. They're all moving into Montpelier, so one side uh, dominates heavily. Um, so that's something that is very important on, on roundabout design considerations. So roundabouts have become a, an option. Um, it's something that we need to consider when we're looking at signalized or, or any intersection treatment may be a do-nothing, four-way stop, signalization, yield signs, all of those are all tools that you use and they all look at them uh, individually and what's the best for all of those pieces. Um, try to wrap it up because I know I'm going on a little bit. Um, as far as the uh, uh, lane and street obstruction, um, I'm, I'm not sure we left it with a, with a completely accurate um, impression on that. Um, I'm not sure, uh, Corey, you, you may be right that you can make an actual ordinance to um, enforce an obstructed intersection, but I wonder how that works because some people will anticipate the light retaining remaining green and will continue to advance. The light turns, then cars kind of uh, accordion effect they all arrive at the intersection and suddenly I'm stuck in this dilemma zone um, and now I'm blocking the intersection. It may be something that you can't prevent. You'd like to leave a little room and I think a lot of people do attempt to leave a little room there and you'll actually see people back up um, to let somebody go through. So I'm not sure that uh, I've always viewed those as, a, as an advisory pavement marking. Um, and with the sign, do not block intersections, it's, um, um, so I, I question whether or not you can actually make that an ordinance. I think it would be helpful to make it more obvious to people that you are blocking an intersection to try not to do it, but I don't know that you can. Um, just like a crosswalk, you might come to a, a crosswalk, you advance, you think you're gonna keep going, the guy in front of you stops, slows for the intersection, now suddenly your, your vehicle's across the crosswalk. Um, didn't mean to, whoops, um, but can you, can you actually be penalized for it? So that's what I had to say about the, the various options. Um, I think there's some, some true merit to the, um, to the possibility of a, of a school main intersection um, that would change that um, possibly to, uh, to a roundabout, but I, I think about the, the, the width of these intersections too. Um, we we're aware of, of how long that is, but we also have to think about the truck turning movement requirements. Um, while we tighten it up for other reasons, the, the truck may still need to make a turn there, and they need that very gen generous radius. And we frequently see a truck will run a tire up on a sidewalk. We know, whoops, we've got a, we've got a, a radius problem here. That um, um, The last thing is, uh, uh, Barry Street in Maine, um, whatever is going to be done there, there's a railroad crossing that's becoming more and more active. It, we know it's going to be a signalized railroad crossing. We also know that there will be no gates. Um, as, as last we heard through the diagnostics review. Um, so it, with signalization, there's a, a system called preemption. Um, when, the, when, the, when the train is arriving, the, the signal will preempt everything else, including pedestrian phase, because the train is arriving and it will clear the intersection. Um, that, that has not been uh, designed. We haven't seen how that's gonna work, whether the memorial in Maine um, will be preempted and how that will actually work. That's a little complicated, but um, so it's, it's entirely, it's, it's possible that a roundabout would actually have to be signalized in order to accomplish that, um, which kind of defeats <laughs> what you're looking at. But, um, and how do you, you can't preempt a roundabout. So you have to preempt everything else so it flushes out. So it does make a lot of, uh, make for a very complicated, whether it's signalized or roundabout, it's a, it's a highly complex intersection. What does a signalized roundabout mean in this situation? Like. Uh, Lights <laughs> and a roundabout? No. Um, I've never seen one. I've seen at the... At the um, we could do both. It, it would prevent... 
it, I'm leave. it may only be that the signal is signalization is the is the flashers that you stop you're prevented to move forward um, whether or not with the roundabout we propose that they do suggest we put gates um, that that may come through final design or through through the design work so so, so I have seen a signalized roundabout. Oh, okay <laughs> <laughs> all right um, um, so back when um, Winooski first put in their massive roundabout, it was actually signalized for pedestrians. Um, yeah. And since they took that out because of the conflict, because of the, I guess, the misinformation, the unexpectedness of going through a roundabout and seeing a signal. So um, that has since been removed, but that how, that's how it was originally put in. Thank you. Yeah. And then, Joe, did you have something to add to that? I too have seen a signalized roundabout. Uh, when we were living in Massachusetts, they decided to signalize the Drumhill intersection and it became a real challenge because you had traffic lights in all four directions, a lot of confusion, it was not a good design. Wow, wow that's something. That's all I will say. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. Interesting. Um, one of the things that, of course, uh, occurred to me while, while you were talking there, Tom, was that um, Again, before we make any decision about the big vision, I think we should be considering um, the costs of, of each of these. Uh, you know, with you know, thinking about like, well, okay, so if if roundabouts cost uh, quite a bit, you know, what are what are we talking about in cost difference um, between between these two um, potential plans or a hybrid or whatever? Um, other thoughts? Is there particularly from counselors who we haven't heard from, and unless you don't want to speak at this point, which is fine, too, but... No, you have to speak. You have no. to speak. No. <laughs> Go ahead, Connor. I, no, I'll just say, I've never felt less prepared to vote and give a green okay. light to okay. something like this. It's it's so okay. comprehensive. It's uh, so many moving pieces on it. I mean, just the fact that, and you reference it, Mayor, it's like, uh, you know, the bike lanes on Main Street. We live in a city with snow on the ground seven months a year, you know? If there's seasonal alternatives, looking at the cost comparisons of this, I think we need to dig in a bit deeper on this. And uh, I don't feel prepared to vote okay. and get the okay tonight. But. Okay. Um, Glenn or Lauren? Uh, Lauren, go ahead. Uh, I, yeah, I agree that it definitely seems like there's a lot of questions raised and maybe some further information on some of the, um, I mean, we might be able to check off a few, like, keeping the signal at State and Main, for example. Um, I don't know if there is agreement on the Berry Street um, two-way bikeway moving to the shared use path as the goal. Um, if We might be able to go through and say, are there some that we can take off the list yeah. um, that we do agree on, whether or not we vote tonight, but just for the further questions we might have for our staff and, and others. I mean, it seems like there's a lot of interest in the school in Maine still considering a roundabout, which I'm interested in learning more. At one point, and this might be a question, um, the, it, I thought I had heard that there was the possibility of like a temporary, so you don't do the full, you know, you could maybe try it out and look at some of the issues like Tom raised of, is this actually um, going to work at that particular intersection with the traffic flow? So, and when, you know, looking at the costs and stuff, if something like that could be part of the discussion as well, I'd be interested in, in thinking about that. Um, so yeah, maybe there's a couple we could check off. Yeah. Find some general areas where we agree and where we have further questions and, um, sure. and narrow the list at least. Yeah, I, I think that would be great. I'd also love to, uh, I mean, even if it's not strictly a vote, just do a, like a little straw poll, just to see where we're at. Mm -hmm. um, and then regardless of the outcomes of that straw poll to say, uh, okay, so you know, it seems like most of us are favoring X or whatever. Um, can we just get a little um, reminder or further information about the potential costs of that? Um, and then ha um, ask uh, folks to come back with, with that information at least. Um, but I, I think that's probably fair to just uh, to, to do your suggestion there, Lauren. Um, Glenn, anything to add? Um, I feel semi-prepared at least to give my opinion on a bunch of these things. Um, I. I think I've been clear, I like roundabouts in general. I am uh, pretty persuaded by the, the uh, arguments about the, the train crossing at the Barry Street intersection and the, the traffic diversion at the State Street intersection. 
uh, to um, to think that we should move ahead for now and signalize Barry Street intersection. Also, I think anything will be better than what it is now, uh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, you know, basically, I think I would bet that we could get behind signalizing Barry Street intersection for now. No, um, the other things that I'm reasonably satisfied with, uh, as Lauren said, I think I would be down with uh, the recommendations as stated for the shared use path down Barry Street on the south side, moving toward permanent. Um, I like the idea of cross-hatching the, the Langdon Street entrance. Uh, I'd rather do it without an ordinance if we can get away with it <laughs> and um, see if that works, if we just cross-hatch it. Um, I'm like the mayor, I'm okay with shifting the crosswalk from Langdon Street to Hazen Place. Um, and I would be in favor of a roundabout at the school and Main Street intersection, uh, preferably by doing it as a, as a painted temporary version at first, if we can get away with that there and see what happens. Okay. Um. So I would love to go through these uh, sort of one at a time, unless there's further comments. Um, so I have I have actually seven things on my list to to go through, and if I'm missing anything, please you know let me know. Um, uh, so th again, this is just a straw poll; um, it's not an official you know vote of anything, um, but just sort of uh, where where people are at. Um, uh, thumbs up, I suppose, if you're up for a, a roundabout at school in Maine. I favor exploring it anyway. I, I've uh, gone you, from saying yes, I would fair. do it tomorrow to say yeah, to yeah, thinking yeah. that we should explore it. We should explore it. Okay, so okay. there's there's a lot of that's, that's a yes. Okay, so a lot of favor for or uh, interest anyway um, in uh, in that um, uh, interest in uh, I'm, gosh I could frame it as like. Uh, would you rather have a roundabout or a signal at State and Maine? Well, how should we frame it? I'm going to frame it in Glenn's terms. So it's signal, signal at uh, signal at State and Maine. Okay. No. No. Okay. No. Uh, uh, no. Oh, no. No. Okay. No. Okay. Um, then that's fair. Okay. Um, so so again, potentially looking into that um, uh, interest in uh, the. Uh, shared use path uh, or bike, bicycle facilities, some flavor um, of being on the south side of Barry Street. If if not, you can you can <laughs> you can be in. I don't know. That's okay. Um, okay. So, but okay. Interest in that. Um, uh, uh, moving the crosswalk from. Well, actually, I'm going to do this in a different order. Um, exploring uh, possibilities of trying to prevent blocking of Langdon Street. That's, uh, that seems like something we could just do with paint like we did in front of the fire station. And maybe we don't put a, you know, a sign there. I, I don't know. Um, definitely interested in that. Uh, so I guess if that's a separate one, then now I have eight items. Um, uh, so next one, moving the crosswalk from Langdon Street to Hazen Place. I'm only a maybe on that. Okay. Um, I, I think it's a really attractive idea because of uh, have the potential for clearing traffic at uh, the Main Street intersection. But I remember reading about a college campus where they built all the buildings and then for a year or two they didn't put any sidewalks yeah. until they watched where the grass got beaten down. <laughs> and figured, well, that's where the sidewalks need to be because that's where people are going to walk. And I just question, I think that Langdon Street is where the people want to cross, and moving the crosswalk won't necessarily change behavior. Grass on all the sidewalks. Uh, other than we have yeah. jaywalkers just further down by the church, and maybe this will bring the jaywalkers to a cluster, middle cluster crosswalk. Cluster the jaywalkers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. 
F fair. Great question. Um, okay. Uh, 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 roundabout at Memorial and Main Street. I'm going to go a solid. I'm not sure. I know I said that I was interested in that before, but I'm I'm not sure that I'm there. Uh, only a maybe. Oh, okay, so we got like three it. three maybes and three yeses. Or you give us cost, and we're probably going to get really yeah, really yeah, practical. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, right, Tom. It's, it's interesting. I mean, I was I was super into that before, and then Tom maybe talked me out of it. Um, okay. Who uh, invited you? <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm saving the exciting ones for last. Uh, uh, how do, I feel like I've heard multiple things about Barry Street and Main Street. So in favor of uh, a roundabout at Barry and Main, I'm going to frame it that way. Hmm. I don't see that working. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Um, okay. Thank you for that feedback. Um, and the last one. Uh, uh, I don't know how to frame it. Uh, putting in the uh, bike lanes on Main Street. Main Street? Yeah, on Main Street, right? I'm, I'm solidly like, I need to, I've been thinking about other things. <laughs> I yeah. need to. I don't know. Yeah, okay. Don't mention me. We. Yeah. Oh, That's not mentioned here. Barry and Main. Did we do that already? Yeah, we the only other so. Well, we do nothing. well, right. So, I, I mean, I could have framed it as, do you want to, would you like a roundabout? And people were, you know, voted. Yes. So, you should do the same. so, okay, so fair enough. So, a uh, signal. We're not action. We're, we don't, we're not justice. Okay, I, I hear you there. Um, so, interest in signal, thank you. Interest in signalizing Barry and Maine. Yeah. Okay. All right, fair enough. Um, I think that is everything. Am I missing anything at this point? Yes, Jack. We haven't talked about this on Main Street, although we have talked about it uh, on this uh, streetscaping for State Street, and that is whether, in considering what we're doing with uh, Main Street, should we also be looking at uh, one of the mayor's ideas, which is reverse angle parking. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's mine, too. Is yes. It? That'll, and and I think it's an intriguing <laughs> idea. I don't know if I'm not sure that it's better or worse, but since we're talking about Main Street, we should I at least throw it out. And I'm someone who backs, backs into parking spaces. I, it's clearly it's safer. So much safer. Um, I would. Um, I don't know how you feel about this, but I could picture that being potentially incorporated into our downtown master plan, especially you know as they are looking at. Uh, the the Elm Street intersection potentially they could. Well, if you do a roundabout at school in May, maybe those spots in front of the library would be better to be have. For their yes. Side. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah, that's fair. But I thank you for bringing that up. Um, yeah, it would take some education, but I I think it's worth it. Uh, <laughs> when we feel like we have that capacity. But let's, I, I'm glad that we're like, like, let's bring that into the conversation too. Donna. When you come back, is there a way to get information? If you do the signalization, one of my concerns is we end up with turn lanes. And so where do the bike lanes go? So if you look down Main Street and you have signals, I would like to see your rendition of where the bike lanes would go. Um, so they're actually in there. Um, what happened, that's why the, the signalization option removes more parking from the streets than the roundabout option. So those parking lanes become the bike, the bike lanes. Oh. So you look at the parking impacts, the signalization okay. has the most impacts because of, because of that. Yeah, so when this comes as a final, I guess I need all of it, not just, yeah. okay. Thank you. Thank so you. I guess that's kind of what I wanted to ask before um, we end here is, you know, ultimately we're looking for some sort of recommendation to, to proceed with design and, and construction. Um, it sounds like there's some some comfort with some things and maybe not with others. And is there some specific information out there that could be provided to help that comfort level? I mean, I'm trying to, you know, we're trying to get us to a point where we have a complete study and, and we can move on. Um, so anything that 
can be provided to us to, to help us get there be, would be great. Um, if you have, I heard some. I heard some um, comments about cost. Um, yeah, I thought well, after the last public hearing, I thought we were going to get cost with this. So that would be really, really so, helpful. So, with the the draft study that was included, there's some costs associated with the preferred alternatives. And that's typically how these are done. Um, they usually don't cost out every option. Okay, so we should just um, use those numbers. Right, but, okay. but they're only listed for the preferred alternatives. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I think if we can, and I think we've kind of done that a little bit, um, I hate to kind of price out every option if there are things that we know are off the table we can kind of take that off the table and just cost what we think are possible options. Um, you know what else yeah. might help with this too is that, I mean, with this whole vision, I mean, there's a lot of changes that we're talking about potentially with this. And so uh, one possibility is um, if I, I, I'm, you know, recalling the, the old, uh, uh, the, the draft that we did look at that had some short-term recommendations and longer-term recommendations. Um, I wonder if there would be any recommendations about you know, this is something we should tackle first, you know, based on either the consensus or the urgency, um, you know, the, the uh, you know, maybe the Barry Main Street intersection is such a problem that that's what we should tackle first, even though it's the most expensive of the things that we're looking at, or, um, or should we um, and, and maybe, I don't know if you would feel comfortable doing that because maybe that's too much policy. You know, would you rather spend more money first or less money first? Um, but uh, but if, the, if you had any recommendations about, um, you know, the order of which to take this, that, that would be helpful. Um, you know, having just seen the thumb scales of um, people at this point, um, it might it might be useful to, to me to see, like, just a, like a one or maybe two page, just sort of summary of like, this is this is what this would, well, maybe that's already exists. Maybe th that's what we already have, basically. I'm trying to think if there's any further information that we need, you know, just to have everything sort of in one spot. So, uh, so we considered including um, an implementation strategy mm -hmm. with staff recommendations, but that's, it's difficult to, it, it's, it's a lot more helpful if we have the uh, you know the preferred alternatives and right. then go from it instead of yeah. trying to um, you know make an implementation strategy based on the entire mm -hmm. uh, all of the options. Mm -hmm. um, so th to me, implementation and prioritization would come after we have guidance on on the alternatives. Well, maybe we just need another one more meeting with <laughs> of all of us to to discuss this. Yeah, Donna. Well, I think we're sort of just avoiding it. I mean, the vote to me. Once you put a signal on Barry Street and State, you're going to do a, keep memorial. I mean, Tom's right as far as time-wise and resources. We see the cost. So you, you've got three traffic lights that have a strong support, and we have a, an interest in school at least trying out a roundabout, and that gives you a direction. I mean, that's what I hear. So why not just face what we're saying, folks, sure, and would, move on? Should we just move, should we just vote then? We could just vote. Yes. I could. If I'm listening to you, that's what I heard. <laughs> are you? Are we comfortable voting on some of these items then? The only one I'm not sure that I'm comfortable voting on is Memorial in Maine, and um, and the bike ped amenities on Main Street. Is that is that fair? If we leave those two out, yeah, yeah, you, you want to see the cost of the Memorial yeah. roundabout? Come on, Ann. <laughs> I do, but also like I just want it to work. <laughs> well, but it won't work with the other traffic lights. You've done yourself in. Yeah. I'm well, sorry. It's one or the other. It just doesn't do. I mean, that's what they what do you think, team? Should we just like, maybe we should just vote? How do you how do you feel about this? <laughs> I'm willing to try to make a motion, Go for and it. then see. Uh, uh, Lauren. I'm just wondering, so obviously we have some MTIC membership here that you all are representing, like our Complete Streets Committee, like are there other voices that might have an interesting perspective that aren't here tonight? Like would one more meeting, is there anything that, that we feel like is missing yeah, or is the same here. stuff? Well, we have your resolutions for MTIC yeah, and I don't know what role Complete Streets plays. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, complete well, Streets is, is more of a... Um, uh, an education and outreach 
focus committee um, when the, the MTIC is more of an infrastructure, so it's kind of applies to them more than it, than it would right. the complete streets. Um, I think if, if, you know, something the complete streets could um, help with is, um, you know, if we talked about temporary implementation, they could take a role in that, um, but they're not necessarily a policy um, group. Yeah, I was wondering if they're advocating for a certain perspective, which it sounds like a lot of us share around pedestrian friendliness and other kind of shared some values I've heard come out from other counselors, like is that perspective being heard from people who think about these issues? <laughs> uh, Don I, I did attend jump. the last meeting of Complete Streets and, and there was a, not a vote, but a general consensus of concern of pedestrians feeling that traffic lights were safer, particularly for anyone with a disability or visual, because they didn't, but anyway. Uh, Joe, anything further? I just had one quick question for um, the consultants. Now, on the Main Street bike pass, is that going to be eliminate parking on both sides of Main Street? Um, it depends on the facility. In most cases, we're trying to retain it on one or the other side, and it alternates depending on the width of the street. But in, it's not eliminating it all the way through the corridor. It's just reducing it. And, and I guess my way in is I know that during the summer we get a big tourist business and also the merchants depend on people being able to park fairly near their businesses. And if you eliminate the parking, that's going to be a challenge for an already challenging parking situation downtown. That's just my way in. Um, I, I would okay, just, well, again, with, okay, the, with the bike facilities, um, again, like we said in the beginning, kind of just after a vision here. Um, you know, if, if it is the, the council's, um, I guess, vision to accommodate those type of facilities and, and accommodate the less confident users, the less confident riders, um, you know, the, and that would be the vision. Some, you know, bike lanes on Main Street would, would be the final vision without necessarily, and maybe it's not time to implement it yet, but that's what we'd be working towards. Fair enough. Um, I'll just say for myself, even so, I would like to look at that at a, at a different time. I need some more time with that particular part of it. Um, but that's just me. <laughs> um, Glenn, you wanted to make some motion. Do you want to take it in the whole thing, or do you want to do it in pieces? Uh, why don't I stumble through it, and people can uh, uh, helpfully second, as often happens, and, and we'll see how it goes. Um, but I, I think I would move that we uh, approve the final draft report uh, with the um, suggested uh, alternative to look at a roundabout at the school and Main Street intersections. Is there a second? Second. So everything else just adopt it as is. Um, I suppose that does include the, the Main Street um, bike uh, stuff too, but fair enough. Again, my sense following Corey is that right now we're just going for the vision, and okay. yes, my vision is. Okay. Um, fair enough. Well, there was a second, right? Okay. Further discussion? Connor? I, I, I'm just a bit uncomfortable even like considering eliminating one parking spot with, you know, in Asking people to continue exploring this, um, if ultimately I feel like I would vote against it at the end, so uh, I'm not comfortable voting on that bike path at this point. On not which the bike path? I'm sorry, which the bike which lane, part? Yeah. The the bike lane on Main Street. On Main Street. Yeah. Would you, Would you like to uh, amend to amend the motion to remove that part? Um. No. no. Sorry. <laughs> sell this outside. <laughs> you can still make this motion if you want. You can still am amend, um, move to amend if you want. Yeah, move to amend. Is there a second? Second. Okay, so we're going to vote on the amendment to take this part out of the motion. Um, this part being the oh, Main Street Bicycle bikes, Facilities. The, the Main Street Bicycle Amenities. Um, amenities. Okay, um, further discussion on that part? Uh, Lauren? I, I seconded, but just want to be clear. 
I love the idea of bike lanes. I just feel like I need more information on okay. before yeah. adopting anything specific. Okay. And, uh, and I want to pursue it. I, I just want to remind, and I don't remember exactly, maybe Corey or Tom does, but this council, a council, a city council, adopted the complete streets, which said our vision was including more real estate for bicycles and pedestrians. This vision statement is just saying, not tomorrow we're going to eliminate parkings. It just says our vision is to support the complete street resolution that we've already made to go towards bike lanes. That's all. Thank you. Yeah. When was that? When did we do complete streets? <laughs> a year ago? Two years? Uh, okay, so we have a motion and a second on this amendment. Um, further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And the motion and the amendment fails because we do not have four. Um, so back to Glenn's motion uh, to approve this uh, the, this um, staff recommendation with uh, roundabout at school in Maine. Um, that, is that an accurate representation? Uh, okay, so we um, have a motion in a second. Any further discussion on this? So uh, Yes, Glenn. Um, it's occurred to me that I do appreciate the MTIC uh, resolutions here, and I'd, I'd be curious if there's any more detail that you can offer from MTIC about how uh, MTIC might envision the Barry and Main Street intersection turning into a roundabout with the rail line going through there. I, because that's really my sticking point, is I can't see how that would work well. But if MTIC has information that I haven't heard or an idea of how that would work better than I can imagine it, um, no, other than some of us have driven through roundabouts with, cro with, with railroads, okay. but whatever their deal was, was their deal, and that the stop right. is like anywhere else, it's outside the roundabout you right. stop. Okay. Yep. Okay. Okay. I uh, guess no. I'm going to say I am going to vote for Glenn's resolution, and it's not because I don't think and have experienced roundabouts, and we'll still more in the day, but if we introduce one traffic light to me, it, it fails, so we have to do all of them. And so I support moving forward. Let's do it. Donna, I so appreciate you. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, further discussion? Uh, okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Well, thank you. Um, yes, Lauren. There were other items on your list that weren't part of like the... Oh, that's right. Do, uh, I'm just curious if we wanted to act on any of them or if there are things that don't need a motion well, the, and we just want to... The other items on the list included um, looking into some way to prevent blocking on Langdon Street. Um, and I think... That was in the report, right? Not blocking Langdon. I mean, I remember they're mo like moving the crosswalk. It's in the bigger report. I don't know okay. if it's mentioned here. Um, I don't know if it's in the report at all. Uh, uh, it, it was on oh, your it presentation. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, you presented yes. it. Oh, yeah. Okay, so it's in one so of the it's part of it then. Okay. It's, it's not necessarily part options. of the recommendation, or is it part of the M1? I don't know. I'll have to. Okay. okay. Um, if it's part of the M1, then yes, it's. Okay, and if not, that. let's you know bring that come back. back to us if you would. Okay. okay. Great. Awesome. Before Tom disappears. Yes. The fire station used to have crisscrosses in front of it and a sign saying "Do not block," and then they went away. Do you know what happened to them? Okay. I don't remember the crisscross, and we were wondering about the sign. It said, it said do not block. It was right yeah. over top of where the yeah. flash, flashing lights. So we were wondering that ourselves. Oh, okay. So we're going to add it back. I don't know. I've been here too long, Corey. <laughs> 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 So I was just, really just wondering if it was removed with it. Oh, it, I would project. bet you maybe even 10, 15 years ago. It got removed, but it used to be there. And you were not supposed to stop in front of the fire station driveway. Makes it was always supposed to be open. Yeah, you're right. Okay, well, thank you all, and thank you for your work on this. And I also want to thank all the folks who came out to the public hearings on, on these topics. It was very informative. It was very helpful to hear from people. Um, so we have... But yeah, yeah, fair enough. About half an hour uh, before I would love to be done. Um, do, go, go ahead. What are you doing next? Well, actually, I would love to ask um, uh, the Krugers if you, uh, what, what thing you would you like to. Animal oh, they, so maybe we should Come on. do that first. I just have to stand. I just can't, my knee can't. You know, fair enough. Longer. 
And, and Seth, were you waiting around for anything in particular? Um, well, I, just if anyone needed clarification on what I was, what I was uh, wanting to propose a discussion topic for a future meeting, I'm willing to talk about that. Oh, fair enough. Well, why don't you and I connect about that sure. um, afterwards? Is that okay? Yeah, that's um, perfect. Okay, because I, I have some further thoughts on that sure. as well um, and would love to chat with you. And Joe, is there anything further you were sticking around for? Or Steve? Nope. Um, oh, okay. All right, so. Just um, entertainment. Yeah. Pure yeah. entertainment. Do other people need a break or are we okay with. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna, take a, <laughs> we're gonna take a two minute break and then we'll take the animal ordinance up first. Okay. We're gonna uh, bring it back together here, team. I have 9.37. Okay, so uh, we are going to examine um, the uh, Chapter 8 uh, ordinances, uh, which is about uh, animals and fowl. Um, I think it's... This is the first reading. Yes, th so yeah, I'm going to open a public hearing um, for the first uh, reading of these changes. Um, since you're here, uh, would you like to go first? I'm happy to let, I mean, I don't <laughs> yes, yes, just come. <laughs> sure. We, we'll focus on your part. Yeah. Well. All right. Uh, I'll, I'll try to keep this somewhat brief. I can go on on this subject. <laughs> um, okay. I'm Kevin Fink. I live on Finch Road. Um, five years ago, my wife and I um, purchased a piece of land that had been intended for subdivision on the northern edge of the city. Um, we were intending to build a home and a small farm on it. Um, I was originally pretty hesitant to purchase something within Montpelier city limits um, with that plan in mind. Cities, even Vermont, have a reputation for being kind of hostile to people engaged in farming and those types of activities. Um, but I, we thought about it a lot, and after a while, and spending a lot of time at the farmer's market and in all our wonderful community gardens and stuff, decided that Montpelier is clearly a town that cares about local food and understands the joy of watching living things grow under your care. Um, I, I still love walking around this town, especially this time of year, seeing all the backyard tomatoes, the flocks of chickens, there's herds of sheep, and so many pollinator-friendly flowers that feed the bees we keep. Um, when we were doing that, I, we were also looking at the existing ordinances governing livestock in the city. Um, and at the time, they were somewhat clunky and antiquated, but in general, weren't so restrictive as to preclude those types of activities. And when I heard the council was going to go through kind of a general ordinance revision process, I thought that was great because it would be an opportunity to kind of tweak and adapt those things to maybe remove some unnecessary or sort of restrictions that no longer made sense. Um, unfortunately, the revisions that are in front of you do exactly the opposite of that. Um, they impose a new bunch of, a new, particularly new implementation that's a concern for me personally as someone who has raised um, pigs for several years on our property. And they also miss an opportunity to get rid of a bunch of unnecessary, I think, um, provisions that pr create limitations for people wanting to, you know, basically f have undergo farming activities in city limits. Um, I, I specifically wanted to talk about pigs for a minute um, because I, I feel like pigs um, have a really undeserved reputation. <laughs> um, pigs have a reputation as being filthy and dirty um, but the, the truth is that pigs are intelligent, vibrant creatures who are far tighter, tidier than their reputation um, belies. It, it's certainly true that pigs can be raised in a manner that creates smell and mess and the like, but that's true of any livestock that is cruelly confined, held in pens without adequate um, bedding that's not changed frequently enough. Um, or other improperly, otherwise improperly cared for. The, the pigs we keep are not like that. We um, rotationally graze our pigs. They feed on excess product from local food businesses and provide them a way to dispose of ingredients they would always otherwise have to dump or find someone to haul out of there. Um, and they, um, 
moving them onto a new pasture is, is one of my and their weekly joys. They, they literally frolic when you open up the gates and let them into the new places. They run around and look for slugs and grubs and clover and all the wonderful things. So I, I really just want to urge you to take the opportunity to not only not make things more restrictive, but also think about whether some of the things, there's some language um, prohibiting um, on farm, well, prohibiting the, the commercial um, slaughter of poultry within city premises, which is a, often a real economic lifesaver for small farms. Um, poultry are some of the, usually some of the few things that can be raised at a small scale that often also provide another pathway for excess product. Um, and provide side income for a lot of small farms. Um, and so basically what I'm asking is that uh, agriculture is admittedly a thing that is sometimes messy and smelly and pretty much always dirty. Um, but I think this is a, a town that can understand that and can recognize the value of it. And I would just ask you to not move Montpelier in a direction where people can't grow food for themselves or their neighbors easily. So thank you. So I, I'll just jump right in on this because I think uh, Kevin raises excellent points. Um, we had an issue, you know, three or four years ago with a person, um, with a, a group of people had a pig in a very small lot in a very congested neighborhood, and we got a lot of complaints from the neighbors about smell and other things, and found that. You know the terms in a manner is to be offensive and viol You know some of those were not particularly effective. And I, I, I'll be honest with you, when we were drafting and going through this, that's what we were thinking of. And I think we probably didn't think about the larger tracts in town and the places where it's perfectly appropriate and desirable to have these things. And um, so I, I don't know if I have a specific language to suggest right here, but unless we just go back to you know, I think the old one had some limitations on how enforceable it was. But uh, maybe it's just you know over lots of a certain size uh, or something like that. I don't know uh, because I, I agree. I think we should be supporting this type of, of thing. So I, I just toss that right out. There was no there was no underlying desire to ban this from the, the whole city. Uh, Donna, do you do you have any specific language? Um, I, 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 I guess I, I kind of uh, agree with Bill um, that. Probably the old language could be massaged a little bit to make it a little more clear, but I think that's kind mm -hmm. of the right, the right framework. Um, I, I do still feel like it's a little unfair to single out pigs because if you keep five cattle in your tiny backyard yeah. lot, you're gonna have a hell of a nasty oh, yeah. problem too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, but, oh, I'm with you about uh, that. Yeah. 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 Um, but well, I that's think that's that's too. the right. Framework is, you know, that's, and, and it's hard to say, you know, I'd, I'd hesitate to suggest a size framework because, you know, you don't necessarily need that much space right. if you do it right. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, the threshold is really whether you're creating problems for other people. Other comments? Um, I, I agree um, uh, with, all, with all of that. Uh, seems f um, like a good point that. Uh, any uh, livestock that is kept in a small enough space uh, is um, it's going to be unduly smelly, um, and, and it and it can be done poorly. And actually, um, I don't know if this is uh, the right connection to be made, but it also seems somehow cruel uh, to keep an, an animal that's of <laughs> relative size in a very small space. Um, and so I know there we we t we're going to take out the cruelty to animals. Um, section, but you know, in that spirit, I, I wonder if there is. And, a and I and I think it. some of those were taken out only because they were covered by state statute. Okay. It wasn't that we were supporting cruelty to animals, but it was addressed in other <laughs> places. <laughs> so. so I I'm certainly up for um, reframing, particularly um, section eight three. Um, it's about keeping swine, uh, and either taking it out uh, entirely, or if we want to go down the road of um, saying, you know, that you can't keep too many animals in too small a space, then, um, you know, there, there may be some opportunity there. Yeah, Jack. I don't know much about keeping swine or slaughtering uh, fowls, but it might 
make sense to consult with the someone at the agency of agriculture for uh, for guidance on how to phrase it so that it um, adequately protects the public interest and yet doesn't work, doesn't preclude these uses. Mm -hmm. The other thing that occurred to me is is there a potential tie-in with the zoning ordinance for because that talks about uh, lot sizes or density levels. Just a thought. Yeah, interesting. Use yeah, as yeah. As a, as a permitted use, that's an interesting thought. Other thoughts, uh, Lauren. Um, just want to appreciate you coming out. It's great to get that perspective. We could have moved ahead with this without thinking of those implications. So. Uh, appreciate that and agree um, looking at language on 8.3 and sound like a couple of different ways to think about it. Um, I was curious about the poultry um, or the, the slaughter in the city. I mean, is that something now? I know it's it's a topic every single year at the legislature, at the state house. Like, is that something that's also just being now regulated at the state level that um, does a city ordinance around it make sense anymore? Um, is it similar to some of the cruelty to animals and stuff that now is regulated that we would feel, maybe we'd want to look at what the state statute is and see if we feel comfortable yeah. with that, or maybe you have some information about that. I, I, I don't know of a perfect command of it, but I can give you a brief, I mean, there, there are definitely fairly extensive agency of agriculture regulation, regulations on on-farm slaughter. There are um, numerical caps in terms of how many you can do a year, which you know keeps size down pretty significantly, um, and um, there's all sorts of requirements about facilities and you know that sort of thing as well, uh, and limitations actually on what you can even sell. I mean, ba basically, generally you have to sell whole animals, um, which um, really cuts down on volume for most sellers because most people want to buy butchered animals. Other thoughts? Uh, Jack. I, I'll just observe, of all the things we talk about at the city council, who knew that this was going to be the issue that would bring Rose back <laughs> to the <window? laughs> It's just wonderful to see you. I promised to come back and help with the ordinance rewrite, and this one hit very close to home. <laughs> <laughs> What's your suggestion? <laughs> yes. I, one suggestion that I have is that, um, you know, you do have a public health officer, so you could think about writing the ordinance in such a way where you leave it to the public health officer to t determine if the animals pose a... Um, you know, a risk to public health. You know, I could see a situation where the, if there were lots of flies or some, or you know, runoff from manure or something like that. Um, so if you kind of left it to the public health officer to make that determination, that might be a way of giving yourself a little bit more, um, more room that, or something more real than what's currently there, um, but still, you know, allowing for some discretion. Great suggestion. And I'm Rosie Kruger, and I live on Finch Road. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I, I think that's a great suggestion. And uh, so, I, I mean, I assume for a second reading, we'll be sending yeah, this we'll back to staff to, to um, adapt this. And the other, um, so just to get back to Lauren's point, uh, Section 8.6, uh, it says dressing for commercial use prohibited. Um, I, that is one that I would prefer to strike entirely um, for our purposes and leave it to the state. If the state is going to regulate on-farm slaughter, um, I want to not create any, any further barriers um, to that. We should be having more um, locally, um, particularly locally slaughtered food um, rather than less locally slaughtered food. Um, okay. Any f anything further on this section? Jack. I had a question from a resident uh, about section 8-1 about running at large as written this would section would include uh, dogs and cats and other animals like that and is that the intent of the ordinance I assume the answer is yes but no because the next section which we didn't um, send out because it was not being proposed for any changes is a pretty extensive section on particularly dogs and pe about where leashes are and where they can run at large and that it's there's okay. a whole special section on dogs thanks well, th i think the question I don't still think remains cats are regulated <laughs> what's that bill i don't think cats are regulated 
but even if I, they were, they wouldn't. I, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, fair. Yeah, so, I mean, my reading of the the item as it stands is that cats are regulated as domestic animals. I mean, I guess that's the question of the definition. Right. But uh, I don't know. I. Uh, as a dog person, I'd be okay with regulating cats, <laughs> but I think that that will probably uh, not be popular overall, at least. We might want to accept cats from that section. That'd be fine with me. Sure. I acknowledging that cats cannot be regulated. <laughs> You laugh, but we oh, have a okay. lot of neighborhood complaints about cats. Oh, Tigers really? Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh. In people's gardens, okay. flower boxes, having cat fights at night. Yeah. It's a big deal in my neighborhood. Good Interesting. Get birds. Well, would you, would you want to keep that in there, Dolly? <laughs> okay. All right. Just, just check. Maybe. But I'll probably get calls on it. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah. Maybe for the next uh, meeting, we should have. Uh, the entire chapter distributed, including the sections yeah. that aren't proposed. We will. We'll take a look at this. We may not have, might be a meeting or two before we get a chance to do all this stuff. For this one, so. Okay. Uh, any further comments about this chapter? Okay, so I'm going to um, close the public hearing, and I think we need to vote on the date for the second uh, reading of this. Is there a motion to that effect? I want you to say to be recommended by staff. I don't know when we'll be. Oh, okay. I move we set a second public hearing at a date to be uh, recommended by staff. Second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so it passes. We'll Thank you. It, we're going to want to look at that. So. Yep, fair enough. Have you ever seen the movie Snatch? Okay. Oh. <laughs> you, you should watch it. <laughs> <laughs> in the meantime, okay. you can continue legally <laughs> having your pigs. <laughs> okay. All right, so we are on to Chapter 7. I don't think we're going to make 10 o'clock here, team, unless, of course, we want to um, bump this item. Um, I assume we want to take it up, though, eh? The Chapter 7? Yeah, or would you prefer to, to bump this to another day? Oh, I'm... I'm going strong. I'm happy to keep going. <laughs> but but if but if the mayor would like to, uh, well, what's what are other people interested? I mean, we're just we're approaching ten o'clock. So, are you okay? You okay to keep going? Okay. All right. We're gonna make it happen. All right. Chapter seven. Comments. There was. Uh, oh, are you gonna open the door? No, no. Here? Oh, um, thank you. Good call. The, the, the signal there. Uh, so we're going to open up the public hearing on Chapter 7, Health and Sanitation. At our last meeting, there was a discussion about some of the definitions and the new draft that we have from staff includes uh, a definition for recyclables, um, or it's in the memo we got from them. And I think that was the only real outstanding issue uh, in this chapter. Yeah, that was right. So that was added into the list. And, um, and we did change the word from swell to swell. That was nice. That's good. Um, and we have a better definition of recyclables, as you mentioned. Um, the only part that I am still um, sort of foggy about, and uh, maybe this was something that we were, because we were going to be revisiting this chapter anyway after um, we had better understanding of what the state was going to do. Mm -hmm. So we may, we may be revisiting it any, anyhow. Um, I was unclear uh, uh, for the, it's the old section 7-2, new section 7-1. On decaying matter, um, I was not sure uh, if we uh, there uh, um, if if someone were composting through a worm bin, but they were let's say they were not going to use their compost on site. Maybe they were going to give it away or whatnot. Um, 
would that be prohibited by this? Well, and I also was government sanctioned food waste composting vessel. I'll confess, <laughs> I don't really know what that means. Good. <laughs> yeah. Do we have a sense of what that means? I don't know how. I think Jamie and Donna drafted this. Um, okay. And she would be the one that, no, Donna would be the one that would know. I assume it means that there's some kind of, you know, composting bin that the city gives Commercial? Out. Could this be commercial. Well, it could be government. Uh, sort of, you know, I guess you could buy a composting bin that the government you know, has meets some kind of standard. I don't know. I don't. I confess, I'm not. So my con my condominium has a, a bin that we do, yeah. and so but it's not government sanctioned. It's anyway. Yeah. So, uh, Glenn? Uh, I mean, the the way I read this language, um, that last clause or composting for on-site use means that if you're composting for on-site use, you do not have to have a government sanctioned food waste composting vessel. It's only if you're composting for off-site that you need a sanctioned vessel. And I think that that was the thrust of the mayor's point that if you're, if you've got a worm bin and you're giving it away to someone else or something like that, does that have to be government sanctioned? Is that? Yeah, that's pretty much what I'm saying. Can you add some words there to make it clearer? Would you just say composting right. vessel <laughs> used for offsite or sold or uh, what's? Personal. I'm sorry? Did you say personal use? Personal use? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, for personal use would probably work. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's if you're giving it away, that's still personal use. Okay, so are we just changing on-site to personal? That, uh, Lauren. Um, so are we prohibiting a commercial composting facility in town through this? The, like, so just flagging, so 2020, we're, we're mandating composting for everybody. Nobody's going to be allowed to put food scraps in their trash anymore. So just being careful how we word this that is actually facilitating what should be a public good thing and not trying to make it unnecessarily mm -hmm. weirdly written that it becomes restrictive or making it harder for people to do that like they need a government approved vessel or whatever <laughs> I would just just thinking about how to make clear composting is okay I mean I don't so totally know what the commercially like, composting you've got to take it up and move it right like if I if I'm putting compost out for so it's got to be in some kind of approved container. I mean, it's commercial. I think that's the point. Is mm. that? But I. Well, maintenance we of a composting vessel. Yeah, I mean, some of them are just like big concrete pads where they right. just have someone just like, is that a vessel? Well, and I wonder. I don't know if I like this idea fully, but um, you know, kind of going back to Rosie's suggestion about the health officer in the previous issue where. I mean, the, I think the reason why this probably exists is because it can be odorous, right? Yes. And that's the yes. same as, you know, with, uh, you know, animals kept in too small a space. Mm -hmm. And because really, like, I also, oh, I, I forgot to mention, I don't want this to prohibit uh, fermentation, mm -hmm. I mean, which is technically decaying vegetable matter. Um, you know, if somebody's... Uh, making making wine or kimchi or whatever right like we can't I don't want to be prohibiting that um, so I mean it may, maybe it's too easy a uh, uh, solution to just kick it to a health officer but but in a certain sense that's like well yeah I mean if it's if it's causing a stink and it's a con continual problem then you know the health officer can take a look at it and maybe that's but then you know what does that do to the commercial Right. Um, composting facilities, but m and maybe that's worth. But the co industrial composting facilities are, I, I assume, already regulated by the state, yeah. and so um, yeah. So you could put language to yeah. Acknowledge that. Isn't that what the language is trying to do? That it shall not apply to the maintenance of government sanctioned those that are permitted. Why don't we just get some better advice on this? Okay. Yeah. Trying to make it yeah. up just. Support. Second reading again mm -hmm. to the next meeting, and we'll talk to some experts. 
Okay. Let's um, figure out what to do with decaying matter. Yeah, right, and uh, making sure that we're not prohibiting right. um, fermented foods. Um, okay, sorry to <laughs> continue. <laughs> <laughs> we can't prohibit kimchi in this town. <laughs> it cannot happen. It works for me. <laughs> or kombucha. <laughs> also, I can't say that word. I always say kombucha. I can't say it properly. Okay. Did, did this solid waste come from somewhere? Like a reference? It's huge. Of all the definitions here. It's just. It, it, anyway, I just wondered if it was some official language found somewhere. Oh, yeah. just I imagine Donna. Um, okay. Okay. As, uh, so so I'm gonna close. To well, to yeah, I'm gonna uh, close the public hearing and the motion. Move to uh, have another second public hearing on this. Um, next meeting should be fine. At our next meeting. Is there a second? Second. Further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Vermont League of Cities and Towns Fair. Every year, the League of Cities and Towns has its town fair, which is a training opportunity and a bunch of other things, but also has an official voting representative from each community to vote on their municipal policy, which then sets the, the um, lobbying st standards for the group for the year. Uh, as I said, each, each community is allowed to have one designated voting member. It's always good if it's an elected official council members I will be going I'm on the board of directors I will be going so if none of you want to go I can do it but it, it's always good I think Ashley did it last year and made her presence known and her pictures <laughs> she's in the, in the picture is, online yeah. I love it <laughs> well I'm going to go too, whether I'm voting or not because I really enjoy them their sessions are yeah. very and people you talk to it's very worthwhile thoughts uh, Connor and then Jack Gonna make a motion to nominate Donna to their voting member. But I go all the time. Does somebody new want to go? Uh, Jack? I'm potentially interested. Uh, I don't know if we have to decide this uh, tonight or if we could uh, give me a chance to check my scheduling and availability. I think we have a little bit of time. Still. Early bird in September 13th. Well, that's for registration, but I think in terms of yeah. the voting well, rep. I'm not just saying, yeah, yeah, but he wants to register if he's going to go. September right. 13th. And, and by the way, any of you that are interested in attending, regardless of whether the voting rep, the city obviously supports that and happy to go. It, it is an interesting time. It's always good. Um, but we do need a voting rep. Uh, right. And so maybe we can uh, take this up on the September 11th meeting. Uh, all right, so uh, that concludes our regular business. Uh, council reports, who would like to start? Uh, Connor. I'd just like to, again, like, thank Sue Allen for Whoa. everything she's done for the city. It's, uh, <coughs> I've worked with Sue both in state government and, you know, here in town, and I, I can't think of anybody who exemplifies a public servant just like Sue does. You know, uh, the door was always open there was somebody who needed something. Uh, it didn't matter if a council member was in there, she'd go out in the hallway and uh, <laughs> make sure they got what they needed. And uh, I think it's a tremendous uh, loss to the city, but we wish her all the best uh, in the future, going down south to the other end of the state there. So thanks so much, Sue. Good. Uh, second, Connors. Thanks to Sue Allen. Thank you. Um, and uh, I've been continuing to really enjoy the summer in Montpelier. Uh, and I want to recommend that anyone who is available uh, uh, do what I did this past Sunday and get out in the Winooski River while it's... Uh, relatively easy to, to wander around in and, and fun. There's a, a Winooski River cleanup on Saturday, September 7th, starting at 8.30 a.m., meeting here at City Hall. I'm not sure I'm going <coughs> to make that one, um, but I know Kate goes every year, and she seems to really enjoy it. Um, 
and only sometimes throws out her back. <laughs> uh, but yeah, just uh, for instance, uh, on Sunday I got to go uh, in a canoe with a couple of other friends in, in a canoe of their own and two dogs uh, from the, the high school uh, down to Middlesex and we stopped at um, Camp Mead. They had food and live music and families all over the lawn and we dragged the canoes out and had had lunch and uh, just canoeing down the Winooski River is surprisingly amazingly fun uh, <laughs> especially with dogs uh, to, to make it a little more difficult. What's that? Well, we could try it. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 the weight of a dog shifting back and forth is <laughs> one of the things that really makes it good. Um, so yeah, uh, highly recommended. Um, and if anyone is interested, I would go again. I'll just borrow the same canoe from my neighbor <laughs> that I borrowed this time. Um, and I'll be at Baguitos tomorrow morning, 8.30 to 9.30. I forgot to post on Front Porch Forum, but I'll still be there. I don't really have a report, but I did want to ask the mayor about the transportation meeting. I've gotten some queries, the one that I believe is on the 18th. Yeah. And just my idea that I thought you said was that you were looking to see all these groups that do transportation in our area, what their services are and their goals, and how they serve us. Yes? What else should they be thinking of? Do you mean uh, the people who are coming to present? Who coming? Oh, who are the people who are coming to present? Uh, uh, yeah, so I, I think it's mostly an update on what work they've been doing, and it's an opportunity for the council and the public to just ask some questions about um, you know how uh, sort of where they're at and what uh, what's possible, and um, so that's uh, that's sort of where. Oh, the other thing I would say is that my my hope is that. Presentations would be about 15 minutes long, okay. um, and that uh, we'd, we'd save some time for questions um, afterwards. Um, in you know, with the intention that the discussion afterwards might be as as long as the um, the the rest of the presentation. Does that does that help? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Cool. I think just to follow on to that, I think some of the idea was that for those that are already providing services, GMT and others, to you know how that's going and w where they might be going, and for people like all Earth Renewables are talking about rail or the, the on-demand transit. So, you know, how realistic is that? What's their time frame? What, what are they looking at to get some idea of what might be coming in the future? So a little bit of, you know, where are we now? What, might what we see in? ahead. Right. Yep. Yep. What yep. are the real okay. options? Because, yep. you know, we make decisions thinking this may or may not be coming, and it would be good to get a reality check of what – So you might just want to send a reminder out and do a little more detailed in that? Yes, yeah, who will cover that? <laughs> <laughs> she's like Tom. She's done, right? Not yet. Oh, it goes till Friday. Oh. oh, let's see. What can we ask her? Come on. Come on. <laughs> uh, and I do want to clarify, actually, about that. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, that I didn't, in my article of the bridge, um, say what time it was happening. But because the intent is, it's sort of like a council meeting with no. Um, uh, no action items, uh, it's just updates. Um, the uh, to keep it in line with that, we were thinking to start about, uh, started at 6.30. Does that help? Yeah. So make sure that that's clear. Cool. Um, just echo my appreciation to Sue. I think Connor summed it up really well, but thank you. We'll miss you. Come visit us. <laughs> um, the, the only thing I wanted to mention was there was a story on VPR the other day about the toxic PFAS in the leachate that's going through our wastewater treatment facility and is going out into the Winooski River and the waters of the state. And I know it's an issue that the entire country is wrestling with this whole PFAS contamination issue and the state's doing a bunch of work and they're going to be looking at leachate and setting standards and um, I just I want us to keep an eye on this I mean right now we're basically and the way it came across in the story was you know there aren't really regulations yet on leachate so we're just going to keep letting it go into the river which goes into you know other people's drinking water supplies down the road and the stuff is at extremely small concentrations is is toxic to human health 
Um, so it's just an issue I'd like us to look into. I think there will be data coming out in the next month or so from the state. So um, I'm just concerned. I certainly don't want us to be, you know, it's kind of presented in that story as, well, we get $300,000 a year for this stuff and we're keeping an eye on the regulations. And um, I, I would just hope we're keeping kind of public health and those issues front and center. Um, and so I'm just gonna keep an eye on it and see what, how we want to address it. But I just wanted to raise that. Thanks. I'll be the last one of the council members. I'm sure Anne will say the same thing to talk about how great it's been to have Sue working for the city. Uh, people love the city of Montpelier and a lot of what makes it great is the able and dedicated uh, professionals that we have working for us and you'll be missed yeah so I, I am gonna say that also Sue thank you so much for your time with us it's been such a pleasure to work with you and I'm, I've just been so so grateful to have you here um, so thank you again um, I also wanted I know Tom is not fully done uh, but I also just want to acknowledge uh, Tom have been so um, grateful to work with him over the years as well. I just uh, so admire his um, his thoroughness and his uh, professionality, and um, I'm just so thankful um, for his service to the city as well. And um, uh, and then I also want to um, just extend my you know welcome to to Donna Barlow Casey coming in, filling some uh, some of these roles in the interim, and so grateful to be uh, working with her as well. So um, anyway, just it's. It's, uh, it's a very exciting time, you know, seeing shifting happening and, of course, sad to, to be losing some wonderful folks, um, but excited, too. So, uh, so anyway, so there's, there's that. Um, I wanted to uh, give a, a, uh, other couple updates on some upcoming events. Glenn, I'm glad you brought up the, the river cleanup on uh, 8.30, Saturday, September 7th. Uh, I think it's usually they meet at City Hall. Uh, to divide up to go to different locations. I am psyched for that. I, it was one of my favorite days in Montpelier. Uh, and then there's also um, that day is going to be um, uh, sort of an, an anniversary celebration of the thrift store at the Trinity uh, United Methodist uh, Church in town. So I just wanted to um, highlight that and make sure people are aware that that is going on as well. It's going to be um, kind of a special event for them. Um, there's also the... Oh, so that's also Saturday, September 7th, and that's at, at noon. They're going to have say a few words. Um, and then uh, Saturday, uh, September 14th, uh, is Montpelier's Drive Electric uh, Day celebration. So the State House Lawn is going to be full of electric vehicles uh, and other electric stuff. We're looking to get an electric uh, bus, and we're going to have electric um, uh, lawn equipment, uh, and uh, food, and uh, we're going to try to have bouncy houses, and um, I think uh, I shouldn't promise ice cream, but uh, I, I know there will be food there, just generally speaking. Um, so that's going to be a great event. I'm looking forward to that. Um, and there was, I feel like there was one other thing that I wanted to highlight here, and I am not seeing it, so I am going to pass. If it comes up, I will maybe jump in again. Um, I think that is it, though. Uh, John. I'd just like to also mention how much I'm going to miss Sue. It's so funny. Jack, you'll appreciate this. When you first started here, I had this little panic, and I had to go back and check on my old Green Mountain Daily Post to see if I'd ever, you know, <laughs> beat you up about anything. I was like, oh, no. And I actually found only one mention of you that I'd written in an April Fool's post um, that was uh, making fun of something that Governor Shumlin had said at the time. I'll, I'll have to show it to you before, before the end of the weekend. It was, if I do say so myself, it was rather clever. Um, the only other thing I would say is while I've been sitting here this evening, I got invited onto the advisory board for the Cyber Policy Institute initiative at the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy. Ooh. So I'm piping back, oh yeah, sure. And of course now I've looked at the rest of the advisory board. <laughs> it's a little intimidating. That's all I got. Okay. Um, can't wait to see Sue go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
<laughs> Count the days. No, um, it has been fabulous. I, I um, just echo what everyone said, and we've had a lot of fun too. Um, it's been really fun to work. And the only reason she's actually still here is she has to give me a ride home. The last <laughs> ride home <laughs> after, after the meeting. It's, it's in the. It's, it's been the first interview question for all the candidates. Is, uh, and Tom, too. Uh, Tom was here. His first meeting is not the director, but uh, he will be still occasionally. You will see him at meetings. He will be working on certain projects and is still our resident expert. But he is going to be, uh, after today, going on a pretty extended vacation. And then, am I, am I correct when I say he's going to be moving his office down to the garage? So he will have less of a presence here in City Hall. He wants to he will work on stuff, <laughs> not have all of us interrupting him. <laughs> so I can't blame him, but he's he's a you know huge asset and has done a great job as DPW director, and we're happy that he's going to be around um, for a while with he, all of his expertise. And, and Sue, um, is, we're all saying goodbye to her on Friday, and then she's coming back on Tuesday. So <laughs> um, to, she's had the important job of taking all the assistant manager candidates to lunch, and there's one more on Tuesday, so she can't. Can't miss that. We, we want to, so yeah. Optimistic. Yeah, we have. Yeah, we have. So yeah, we're. In the, I was. That was the only other thing I was going to report is we are in the midst of interviewing those candidates uh, and then the DPW director candidates as well. So we'll be done all of that process by the end of next week, and then hopefully do our final reference checks and you know see what happens. Right. We'll yeah. pick some names out of the hat. And <laughs> at this point, we, at this point, I think we could. So the first two have been outstanding, so we're looking forward to seeing the, the oh, next two. Hell yeah. Oh my yeah, god. Yeah, that's right, John's been there. <laughs> There's some great candidates. So cool. good. Wow. That's all I have. Uh, so I did remember the one other thing, um, which is just that uh, we did have that uh, public hearing uh, on the energy efficiency uh, disclosure uh, ordinance. And I, I will tell you that my impressions coming out of that were actually quite positive. Um, there, there was some, uh, you know, concern, um, but it was, it wasn't the flavor of concern that was like we shouldn't do this at all. I mean, there, there was one person who did say that, um, but, but generally speaking, and even the realtors um, had some productive thoughts, and there were quite a few realtors actually who said that they were invested in and interested in um, contributing to this process and wanting to be a part of it in a productive way. And I, I thought that was just fabulous. So um, more conversation. It might not look like what we thought it was going to look like, and that's OK. Um, but just having more people at the table is good. So I'll just leave that there. And I think that is it. So uh, unless there's anything further. Um, we're going to um, adjourn the meeting uh, without objection. 1019.